Stephanie, are you sharing your screen for Ewan or are we going to wait for Justina? Hi, this is Stephanie. Um, I think I'll be sharing my screen for Ewan's intro slides. Beautiful. Why don't you go ahead and uh, get that up? Okay. Great. Let me know if that works. Right now, Are I'm you seeing able to see my screen share. If you go oh. into um, the, if you. Uh, so I am, ah, oh, perfect. I'm Ewan Burney. I'm the chair of GA for GH, um, Deputy Director General of EMBL, but also the chair of GA for GH. And the first thing uh, to stress is that if you're, um, uh, there's a variety of languages that you can hear a simultaneous translation of uh, all these uh, plenary talks in. And that's in Japanese, in Spanish, in German, and in French. And uh, this information is on the attendee hub, but also if you go to the bit.ly, the, the GF4GH um, uh, bit.ly link on the below there, you can uh, simply click on the language that you want to listen to, um, and it will provide you that audio uh, for this. Next slide. And um, this is now a massive welcome to everybody here uh, who's tuning in. Uh, we will be generating some stats as we go about how many of you there are and around the world. But if we go to the next slide, we know that this is the most geographically diverse meeting um, uh, we've had to date. So thank you, thank you so much for everybody who has uh, tuned in, spent some of their time, taken some of their time out. Uh, to listen to this plenary. You're very welcome here at gf gh We're making a virtue of the pandemic and reaching more people than ever before. Next slide. And with that note of the pandemic, uh, we really appreciate um, your attendance and your attention. We know the pandemic is not over yet. Um, uh, this virus will be with us for a long time, I suspect. Um, and we know that many of you have had a really tough year um, and you may be looking forward to quite challenging times. So thank you very much um, and uh, for attending this and um, please keep yourself safe um, uh, in the future. So next slide, please. Uh, 
as you can see, this uh, event uh, is now being streamed in a by the C event um, crew um, with direction and better ways of handling slides and people. Um, but if you need help as well on uh, not just the technical work, but also on just aspects of Geo4GH, please use the Geo4GH Slack channel. Uh, so there's geo4gh.slack.com on the general channel. Anybody can join, or you can send an email at operations at geo4gh.org. Next slide. I mentioned the attendee hub already. Uh, this is the kind of front desk, the home door of this conference. So please go there. Um, it's in your email as well when you've registered. Um, so this is the way to get orientated. It magically works out the time zone that, that at least it thinks you're in and helps you orientate the sessions that you can go to, in particular the uh, uh, different tracks. Next slide. And you can um, connect with people around the world across ga for gh The Slack workspace has multiple channels uh, for conversations from the very basic to very technical. Uh, please do tweet. We love our tweeting. So um, uh, you can uh, tweet at us at geo for gh uh, and use the hashtag geo for G uh, hashtag ninth plenary and uh, geo for gh community. Um, later on, uh, there are some uh, mixer events where we go to spatial. And if you haven't been to spatial, it's an online way of meeting people and uh, a kind of drinks and coffee session online. So I look forward to meeting many of you at the spatial events um, later on in the next couple of days. Next slide. Now we're going to do a little test here um, to get questions from you around the world. We use a, an app called Slido. So you can either um, uh, just type in sly.do, so Slido into your browser, and then uh, enter the event code geo for gh or you can use the QR code, which is shown right here, to do this. And we're now going to uh, see if you can use that. So please ask me anything. So, um, and Stephanie, I'm not quite sure. Can you go to the Slido view as these come in? So do type in your questions. Well, that's a great question for someone. How's my morning going? It's actually the afternoon here in London, um, but I have got a cup of tea and um, I'm happily drinking it in a very British uh, way. Um, it's definitely tea because I'm British and it was raining, but it's not raining here. Um, <laughs> Uh, for the unladen uh, European swallow, yes, I think whether whether it's European or American, I'm not sure. Um, so that's great. Keep sending the questions um, uh, coming in. Uh, so I've uh, it's it's raining and the weather is no, it was raining. The weather's dry. Um, how much how how much sleep did I get last night? I was pretty good. The new exercise, Anne has asked a good question to me. What new exercise routine have I adopted? Well, that is, um, I started swimming a lot um, once swimming pools were open. So I've really got uh, that. I am looking forward to getting back to Melbourne. Um, and my car does have fuel. That's a good topical question for a Londoner. Um, at the moment. Um, so the three hours sleep between sessions, so that we do have a time zone challenge. So we know that not all of you can make all the sessions. Um, they are going to be, I think, available after the plenary to watch. 
Um, and I am sorry that, that the way the globe works and human circadian rhythms, um, uh, there are some people who who can't be at everything, basically. Right. Do, do we think we've done enough uh, here? Uh, that sounds good. Right. Thank you very much. So that has proven that we can use Slido. Well done, JF4JH community. Um, and let's go uh, to the next slide, uh, Stephanie. Right. So um, just to take you through, uh, this is the plenary track, and it's going to take us into then the, the afterwards, after the plenary, um, there's track one, which is about GF4GH, the story so far. If you're new to GF4GH, this is the track you should be on. And then track two is about uh, collaboration and how you execute collaboration, track three, responsible data, and track four, um, expanding the scope and impact of GF4GH. These are the different uh, sessions that you can join after this plenary are not simultaneous you have to choose them from the attendee help great next slide please so if you stay on here um uh you get um uh in a moment our keynote uh who which is harold varmus um we know he's uh on the internet and should be arriving soon uh then you'll get um, an overview and updates from GF4GH across our work streams. Uh, then some spotlights on particular standards that have come out this year and the FAST project, uh, which is our basically our cloud testing environment and an introduction to a new system called the Starter Kit, which will help, help um, modularize and retrofit reference implementations. Retrofit meaning that you can deploy them not only on clouds, but also on traditional HPC systems. Then there'll be closing remarks for today, and uh, you can see some posters. Right, next slide. Are we on to, is Harold? Oh, yes. Um, we do expect you to uh, behave online well, so be respectful, be transparent about potential conflicts of interest. I should note that I'm a long established consultant to Oxford Nanopore, a company that sells sequencing machines. And we won't tolerate discrimination, harassment, sexual harassment, disrespectful behaviors, or violence, but um, uh, including online violence. Next slide. And now a very warm thank you to all the people who were the program committee members for this. So Melanie, Brian, uh, Chisato, Jan, Nara, Orion, uh, Shakulata, uh, Teresa, Zonitas, and Monica. Um, thank you so much. And as you can see, a diverse set of people around the world um, contributing to how this uh, plenary has been organized. So thank you very much. Um,
Harold, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you back to uh, the geo for gh plenary. Um, you don't need much introduction, but for the people who do not know Harold, Nobel Laureate, um, Director of NIH, Director of the National Cancer Institute, but perhaps most importantly, one of the true visionaries for open science over many, many decades. So Harold, we're very honored uh, for you to provide a um, plenary talk and over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is it beating back there as well? It is. So um, I'm not sure. It? Maybe turn the volume down. Yeah. I don't think that's a I think I'm on multiple. And I'm sorry for these technical glitches. They're beyond my comprehension. Um, Ewan, thank you for uh, hosting me. Uh, very nice to be in touch with all of you. Um, as Ewan knows, I've been involved with uh, the GA4GH before it was called GA4GH, but it was simply an idea that many of us had that we ought to do something to improve the standards and the ex acceptance of genomics for many purposes, especially for health. Uh, and I've enjoyed watching the growth of this organization and the way it's become the global convener and the arbiter in the practice of genomics with emphasis on uh, standards for practice, uh, ethics, mechanisms of use, uh, communications uh, applied to often uh, mainly to research, but also to clinical care and many other activities. Um, this is a time in the history of this field when, uh, for a variety of reasons, it's important to, to give uh, further attention, additional attention to the question of the equity with which we practice genomics. And um, uh, although I do have a role here as the, the, the chair of the Senior Advisory Committee for the GA4GH, uh, I'm going to ignore that role and focus entirely uh, on two projects um, that uh, I've been involved with over the last year or two uh, to try to improve uh, the way we apply genomics to populations that have not been experiencing the benefits of it over the last uh, several years. I can have the next, if you, I can't control my own slides, so I've got to use the word next. So two examples I'm going to uh, uh, delve into a bit. First, uh, the experience I've had over the last few months in trying to provide advice to the, to the World Health Organization on expanding the application of genomics to further the goals uh, of the WHO in global health. And um, I will tell you about a report that, th that a new science committee is putting together and how uh, the GA4GH is and can continue uh, to provide advice to us uh, in doing this. Uh, secondly, I want to speak more briefly to the development of a research consortium through the New York Genome Center in New York City to study the role of genetic ancestry in various aspects of cancer, including cancer risk, uh, prevention of cancer, cancer initiation and progression, cancer outcomes, and so forth. And I'll come to that in a few moments. Next slide, please. So about uh, uh, three or four months ago, uh, the World Health Organization um, appointed a new council uh, to oversee um, its uh, sci the scientific activities that are connected to uh, the, the goals of uh, WHO. Uh, this slide simply illustrates the members of this small council. We only have nine members, uh, but there is extreme diversity, as you can see by looking at the, um, the location of the eight other members um, uh, from Asia, Africa, uh, uh, Middle East, Europe, uh, and uh, this group, which has also quite a lot of professional diversity, people who represent public health, who uh, do research of various kinds from the clinical to the basic, um, have been um, brought together to, by ne next slide please, to provide, next please, thank you, to provide um, uh, advice to uh, Dr. Tedros, who's the Director General of WHO, um, in conjunction with uh, our close working relationship with Sumya Swaminathan, who's the chief scientist at WHO, to tell um, Tedros about uh, <clears throat> new opportunities uh, for uh, applying uh, recently developed science and technology uh, to improve global health, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, this council has begun to meet on a very regular basis 
and we decided without a whole lot of, uh, of, of uh, controversy to focus our initial report on the various factors that uh, are entailed in the wider use of genomics, especially in poor countries. Next slide, please. Um, we tried to put out an initial statement to the world uh, through a, a letter to Tedros and through uh, some op-eds uh, to announce that our council existed, uh, that we have intentions to do a large-scale report. We couched um, the, this announcement uh, in the context that everybody understands the need to use genomics. I can have the next slide, the next click, just click, please. Thank you. Uh, to uh, use genomics in the current uh, emergency context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is an example of an essay that I published in Financial Times uh, last month uh, to ex explain why it's important to be doing uh, genomic analyses of viral pathogens, in this case, of course, SARS-CoV-2, um, and how um, the wider use of genomics uh, just for this specific and highly understandable purpose uh, for uh, um, forecast the need for broader uses of genomics, including human genomics, uh, to deal with a variety of health problems that we have seen um, uh, successfully confronted uh, through the wider use of genomics um, and the, to explain the rationale for expanding the use of genomics in even the poorest of countries. Um, to take those steps toward this report, uh, we um, have been setting up a planning process that, I, the next slide please, uh, uh, has taken advantage of uh, uh, our friends at GA4GH, in, including Peter Goodhand, whom you'll hear from soon, and Ewan and others, uh, to prepare um, for our report on genomics. And we've currently um, uh, begun, well, more than begun, we've uh, outlined the plans for uh, three workshops that I want to describe very briefly and to explain how those of you who are affiliated with and uh, engage with the, um, the GA4H, GH can participate uh, at least indirectly in these workshops that will be, that are intended to help inform our council uh, to make the best recommendations possible for uh, the implementation of genomics in, in the poor countries of the world. The first workshop, if I can have next click, uh, is addressed to the benefits of genomics. It will take place on November 5th. Uh, and the idea is to outline the reasons for making the effort to more broadly um, use genomics in all countries of the world, 192 members of, of WHO. Um, and that includes most, most importantly, um, the use of uh, genomics in medical care and public health as illustrated by the pandemic, but uh, by uh, work in cancer and, and inherited disorders and uh, metabolic diseases and many others. But we also want to illustrate and uh, emphasize the other benefits of genomics for economic growth, for uh, agricultural uses, which of course have uh, implications for health through um, nutrition, uh, through education in, in the educational domain and many others. Um, the next workshop is going to be conducted uh, on November 19th, and it addresses the central issue that uh, uh, will be raised by virtually all governments and uh, other organizations that are uh, would be responsible for establishing genomics in, in, in poor and lower middle income uh, in low and middle income countries, and they include some of the technical and financial issues that uh, have to be confronted to get uh, genomics established, but then. Um, also, um, have to, we have to consider some of the issues required for the maintenance of an effective uh, uh, set of tools for, for uh, doing genomics in these uh, relatively uh, poorly financed settings, that is establishing and, and paying um, a cadre of pers skilled personnel, uh, having equipment that's not simply purchased, but also maintained and, and serviced appropriately, uh, flow of reagents, uh, at reasonable costs, uh, governance system to ensure the fidelity of the uh, genomic methods, uh, regulatory apparatus, and so forth. And uh, we're looking especially for um, stories of experience with uh, these uh, uh, impediments to implementation and ways that 
Uh, some institutions and countries have solved them. The third workshop will deal with many issues that are particularly uh, well pursued within uh, the, the activities of the GA4GH, namely some of the legal, ethical, and regulatory issues, uh, uh, ways in which those issues have historically been confronted in countries uh, with more or less uh, success, um, and uh, some of the specific issues that will be dealt with in that workshop include uh, data sharing, uh, consent, uh, equity, uh, the, the risks to individuals who participate in studies or uh, allow their clinical information to be used, the standards that, that have to be reliably set for genomics to be practiced uh, with good effect in all countries, uh, and how uh, an approach to genomics uh, intersects with cultural norms in a variety of, of, uh, of geographical settings. Um, the next piece of information tells you uh, that uh, uh, these workshops will consist of, of formal talks, uh, some case studies, uh, open discussion, um, and will be these workshops will be accessible to the public um, through, uh, and we will advertise uh, in various ways um, how to get access. At the moment, we're very eager to have suggestions uh, that we can use during the planning process because the, the, the these workshops have not yet been um, uh, set in stone, and I've provided uh, an email address at sciencecouncil at who dot uh, uh, international uh, to uh, allow you to um, send us any information you think might be useful and pertinent uh, to the development of these workshops, uh, as we and and the uh, um, representatives of of GA four GH and of other organizations like H three Africa and uh, and the um, and um, uh, the G2MC and others uh, help us in the planning process. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'd like to turn briefly now for a couple of minutes to tell you about another approach to sharing uh, the benefits of genomics um, locally within our own population in the New York region uh, through an initiative that we call Polyethnic 1000 that's being organized by the New York Genome Center, where in full disclosure, I work part-time and many others do as well. Uh, the New York Genome Center, for those who don't know, is an organization established about a decade ago uh, with the affiliation of about uh, uh, now nearly 20 uh, institutions in the New York region, uh, philanthropic support, some support from NIH and other funding organizations uh, to do uh, work that uh, research and some clinical work uh, in mainly in three major areas, neurodegeneration, um, uh, autism and other neurodevelopment uh, dis disorders, and in cancer. And over the course of the last few years, my colleagues and I have developed this initiative, uh, which is uh, intent to, um, uh, to, um, to supply the large databases that are that exist and are currently growing, but are populated largely with uh, cancer genomic information that comes from patients of Western European descent uh, by focusing our activities on the ethnically diverse underserved patient populations in, in the New York um, health system. Um, so that includes African-Americans, uh, uh, Hispanics, Asians of all kinds, South, South and Central Americans and so forth. Uh, and as you'll hear, we've made some progress toward um, setting up this system. And I want to spend a couple of minutes telling you what's been entailed in just getting uh, this uh, research organization established uh, and uh, what we're intending to do um, in the near and more distant future uh, to try to promote um, a more equitable approach to cancer genomics that benefits people of all ethnicities. Next, please. So this slide illustrates in uh, sort of uh, uh, kaleidoscopic uh, color detail uh, the, the ethnic diversity of New York City. And you can see uh, Manhattan and the Bronx on your left. The lower right is uh, Queens, Brooklyn, and, uh, uh, and some of the areas on Long Island. Um, this is the region that we're focused on, although some of our participants come from New Jersey as well. Um, and um, we have uh, nearly 20 uh, participating sites that uh, are indicated by the little blue squares. Uh, these are largely hospitals and academic health centers scattered throughout the New York metropolitan region. 
Uh, we have at least 40 faculty collaborators. We've established a, a large number of working groups to deal with the regulatory and, uh, and technical issues that uh, are uh, um, involved in this project. Um, uh, we've hired pathologists and site coordinators uh, and uh, have uh, leapt through a number of, uh, of, um, of uh, or leapt over a bunch of hurdles that have to do with the uh, uh, approval from institutional review boards, uh, settling uh, legal issues and technology transfer issues between the institutions that are collaborating <clears throat> and have identified scientific leads at each of these institutions to help us with this project. Next, next slide, please. So one of the first things we wanted to do was to show that the system actually worked. We could take samples from a wide number of, of, of hospitals, bring them to the New York Genome Center for ascertainment of pathology and, uh, and in the initial case, uh, just a whole exome sequencing, although the goal is to do a whole genome sequencing on the samples, as you'll hear, uh, and to show this actually works. We can get some information from these samples and uh, the, a, a system with this complexity is actually workable. Um, I'm sorry that the, the the size of these objects on the slider is uh, um, uh, unfortunately much too small. I would scold any postdoc who made a slide like this, but, but uh, what's shown on the left is the difference between self-declared ethnicity is uh, usually a usually accompanies any patient record where people declare themselves as African American or white or or Hispanic, um, where the there are only three or four colors involved. And then uh, by doing um, whole exome sequencing, we have enough information to begin uh, using guidelines established by other investigators to uh, uh, to uh, identify the continent of origin which immediately reveals that, um, that African-Americans are partly of African origin, partly of European origin or uh, other major geographical areas. And the bottom panel on the left uh, shows um, what happens when we look at more regional indi genetic indicators of ancestry. And um, although it's not really important to see the, the, uh, the, the um, designations of all these uh, colored blocks, it's clear that that uh, the, the ancestral complexity of these individuals becomes much more detailed than we could ever possibly imagine from any simple personal history and self-declaration of ethnicity uh, in a way that we think will be significant as we get deeper into this project. On the right is simply sh shown, um, but probably invisible, uh, the kind of genetic evidence that we've gotten from looking at these samples, that is many kinds of mutations, translocations, uh, gene copy number variations, uh, base substitutions from known tumor suppressor and, and, uh, and proto-oncogenes um, with uh, lists of some of the tumor types that, that have been analyzed. And that doesn't require any more explanation. It simply shows that uh, this, these analyses with samples that we've gotten from uh, repositories in the participating hospitals uh, do yield information that's uh, that is um, uh, relevant to uh, and, and 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 consistent with uh, current uh, practice in, in cancer genomics worldwide. Uh, next slide. Uh, just, no, sorry, you missed one. Something's missing. Go back one. Back one. Can you go back one slide, please? No, there's something just missing. Um, I don't know why I sent it to you. Anyway, um, what I had on the slide that's missing is uh, a description of the, uh, the the stage we're now in with Polyethnic 1000. Uh, we were able to accumulate resources, that is money, from um, a, a, a substantial number of donors and from some of the institutions that participate to set up a grants program in which we've funded seven groups of investigators at many of these participating institutions uh, to carry out uh, two-year projects uh, uh, that address uh, eight different types of cancer, uh, largely in African-American communities, but uh, also there's one that addresses uh, 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 East Asians and uh, uh, in the context of, uh, of questions about possible relationships between some aspect of tumor genesis or the response to therapy uh, as seen in um, these uh, ethnically diverse populations. Uh, 
these projects are funded with fairly modest resources, a few hundred thousand dollars each. They're overseen uh, by senior scientists uh, who work with us at the participating institutions. Uh, they're coordinated by uh, two um, young faculty members, both happen to be African-American, who are designated as our ethnicity and cancer scholars uh, at the Genome Center. Um, and uh, uh, those those projects are simply uh, in fairly early stages, but we are envisioning ways to expand our local network to work with uh, scientists in other cities, other urban areas who may might be interested in setting up uh, parallel efforts and benefit benefiting from our experience. Uh, we hope to have a, 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 a more um, expansive approach to ethnicity that is uh, with many more projects addressing other populations than African Americans, uh, with more tumor types than the eight that are currently being addressed. To do this, of course, will require increased resources, and we're working with a number of funders to try to obtain those. Um, and um, uh, the, the goal is to be doing um, a whole genome sequencing and analysis, of an, a special expertise of the New York Genome Center and eventually to integrate that information with clinical and social information, uh, working in addition more closely with some of the affected populations uh, using the skills of social scientists who uh, can help with patient engagement, uh, especially when there are cultural impediments to engagement of these individuals in prospective genomic studies. Uh, I'm gonna conclude here uh, and uh, uh, ask if there are any questions. I appreciate your attention to these two new initiatives, and I hope we'll hear from you during the question period and thereafter if you have suggestions about either uh, the, the approach we should be taking with the, the World Health Organization to uh, more widespread uh, uh, introduction of genomics into, into health care practices, uh, and uh, if you have suggestions about the work we're doing in the New York Genome Center on uh, ethnicity and cancer, I'd be happy to hear about those as well. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. And uh, Stephanie, if we can get the Slido up. Thank you so much, Harold, uh, for the questions. Um, maybe as the questions come up, Harold, what do you think is the most important thing, you know, with those, those WHO workshops, what's the most important input you need uh, from the scientific community? Right, well, I think, it's, yeah. So I think the critical thing here, Ewan, is that we get the benefit of experience that people have had in trying to set up uh, genomic enterprises in, in uh, restricted, uh, uh, restricted uh, settings. So I, I think we all are going to agree that there are many benefits to genomics and that those benefits may vary from country to country, but for everyone, there will be potential health benefits depending on the kinds of diseases that are prevalent. Um, and there will be uh, the prospect of the kind of cultural benefits, social, economic, uh, educational, that come with just an increased attention to modern technologies. Um, but the, the, the place where I think um, things will be most difficult in trying to get uh, a wider application of these uh, advanced uh, uh, technologies uh, will be in uh, things as, as pedestrian as uh, uh, how reagents flow from the providers of reagents to countries, how uh, service contracts can be established in an efficient way, uh, how trained personnel can be, uh, first of all, trained, and secondly, induced to do this work in a relatively uh, limited setting rather than in uh, the advanced economies where salaries are better and working conditions may seem easier. So I really urge people who are on this call who have had some experience in dealing with the, the establishment of, of genomic technologies in poor countries to let us know uh, not only what works, but whether there are people who can speak to those issues. We haven't fu fully um, completed the invitation list and we are looking for people who would be making uh, useful contributions. Now my goal is as the chair of the council is to deliver uh, to Dr. Tedros not a 500-page compendium of what's great about genomics, but instead uh, a short practical manual for how we can proceed to uh, to make 
uh, parts of the world that, um, as you can see from this pandemic, often see the benefits of, uh, of modern technology at the, at, the, at the last possible stage. Great. So that was, uh, so we've got some other questions. I noticed that Nicolas Rabin has actually answered one of the questions via this, which is great. Um, but maybe this question, what about looking at pediatric diseases, including cancers, and about other omics? So I think this question here, Harold, is, is sort of how broad is your remit in WHO genomics? Is it, is it you know, wh where does this start and where does this end in terms of well, the sorts of diseases that you're looking sure. at? I mean, I don't think we're going to prescribe what, uh, you know, there's so many countries involved in WHO uh, and the, 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 uh, the, the, the diseases that are prevalent in those countries vary a lot. So there are places where malaria is common and the, and, uh, the genomic methods that might be used for diagnosing malaria, uh, identifying its strains, uh, looking for drug resistance, uh, those uh, might be quite different from a country that, that has uh, um, a, a, a high prevalence of some uh, genetic abnormality that, uh, that, that produces uh, uh, children with, 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 defects, with, birth, with defects at birth. So I think the goal from my point of view is to um, establish a menu for um, for de developing genomic capabilities in a way that allows individual countries or institutions within countries to direct uh, the use of uh, their capabilities to specific problems that are particularly prevalent in that country. And I, I just think we can we, all we can do is illustrate why it's good to have uh, genomics if you have um, a, an epidemic. Uh, why, why it's useful if you have uh, a high prevalence of sickle cell disease of a certain type, uh, why it's useful if you're dealing with the, with the uh, ancestries that produce diseases like Tay-Sachs or um, BRCA mutations. I, I think uh, it's going to be up to the healthcare practitioners and public health experts in each country to decide how the technologies get used. Okay, that's great. I think we've got um, time for maybe one more question, Harold, and uh, just picking out an interesting one here. Um, are you going to look into the historical trace, the history of American ethnic groups, well, the genomes that you're getting in New York? And very practically, do you have a historian on the team? Of, um, uh, well, we, we, uh, we welcome other. having one, and if somebody there is who sounds like a historian is willing to volunteer to help us out, that would be great. Uh, you, you may have noticed that I did have the word history or historical on a couple of slides. And I do think that uh, if you're going to understand um, the, the way in which people apprehend the use of genomics in the context of their own cultural tradition, which is something we face frequently in America because of our indigenous peoples, uh, that uh, it is important to know about the history of uh, the ethnic groups that are being approached. And of course, you know, if you you can't do this kind of work without uh, collaboration with with patients and, uh, and with their families and with their communities, and uh, we have been discussing with uh, a number of social scientists in New York the best way to in, engage with patient groups and try to understand their perspective because uh, um, neither group, either the investigators who are, want to learn more nor the, the participants who want to benefit from whatever is done without, uh, without violating respect for their uh, ethnicity and history, uh, if those things are going to, to uh, work collaboratively to, uh, to yield the best outcomes for everybody. Uh, it's going to be important to understand the history of the societies and the micro societies within our cultures uh, to, um, to pursue things in the fairest and most equitable fashion. Uh, that's great. Harold, I think we would, I would certainly love to keep chatting. And uh, that was a great slide about the diversity of New York. Very, very good luck with the WHO council meetings. I know many people are going to come. And thank you so much. Well, I'm very, I just to say that we're very grateful to GA4GH, uh, to you and to Peter and others for your contribution so far to this planning process. Thank Perfect. you. Right, with that, I think we go over to the CEO of uh, Genomics England, uh, not Genomics England, of GFGH. <laughs>
<laughs> Thanks, Ewan. Can I have my first slide, please, Justina? And while we're, while we're doing that, I would just like to say hello to everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I think we're going to skip the Q&A at the end of my talk and Susan's talk, and we'll pick that up at the end of Laura, so we'll try and pick up a little bit of time. Uh, as you <laughs> corrected, I am the CEO of GA for GH. I've been involved for about nine years this month, and one of the very first people we reached out to uh, at NIH and NCA was Harold Vermas. And so it, it's a great pleasure to hear this come full circle and now be talking about how GA for GH is helping and assisting WHO. Next slide. And we will use Slido. I think by now you've got the hang of it. Uh, if we can't get to all the questions we'll, in person, we'll try and get to them later in writing. Next slide. So I'm, I'm going to focus more on the organization of GFJH, and others will talk much more about our work in the science. Um, from the beginning, GA4GH was always intended to be a big tent. We wanted it to be as broad and as inclusive a community as we could make it. But over those last nine years, we've been adding more structure, more substance, more stability. Um, from the beginning, the host institutions were critical. It would never have got off the ground without the host institutions. Increasingly, a set of core funders and other funders have come in to support the work it was carried out by volunteer contributors and by the host institutes themselves. The change in 2020 was at the top of this slide where we added the not-for-profit, GFJH Inc., which is small in terms of activity. It's less than 5% of our funding or activity, but actually a keystone in creating the stability for the whole organization in that it allows us to form relationships with international bodies like the WHO, ISO, it gives us the ability to hold and protect our IP and keep it open for everyone. It allows us to attract sources of funding that are not academic grants. So a huge benefit to having the sustainable uh, stability of a not-for-profit GA for GH. Next slide. I mentioned core funders in that inner circle. Progressively over the last several years, they've been taking uh, the financial burden away from the host institutes, although some of the host institutes are still heavily, heavily committed, but the increasing number of core funders, and core means over 200,000 US for over three years as a commitment, usually through a grant mechanism, and often we've competed for those grants, but this is giving us a real solid financial base. Next slide. We would never have succeeded without the host institutes. In the beginning, it was Broad, OICR, and Sanger. More recently, UN's organization, Embol EBI, has joined as a key host institute. And we've also been fortunate from the beginning to have voluntary contributions from member organizations. We write to everybody. Uh, each year, a, a few uh, of those organizations feel not only that can they contribute expertise and personnel, that they can contribute financially. And particularly thankful to AWS and DNA Stack in 2021, and obviously welcome any more supporting funders. Next slide. Well, I did want to start though on this concept of assigned experts. And what we've recognized is that most of the international funding agencies have a, or the national funding agencies have a mandate that they have to spend money inside their geographical boundaries, their jurisdiction. They cannot send money to host institutes in other countries. We felt it was important, therefore, to create a mechanism by which agencies and organizations worldwide could fund uh, the activity of GFJH, but keeping it in country, in Japan, in Australia, in whatever place they're based. And the assigned experts were looking for people who can be dedicated at least 30%, ideally 100%, but anything 30, 40, 50, up to 100% but assigned. And the, the difference is that today we've been, we've been privileged to have hundreds of people contributing a fraction of a time at the edge of their desk. And this is a much more dedicated portion of time and paid by an employer to give that time to GFGH. This will allow us to scale even more. So next slide. Up until this time, 
it has taken hundreds of volunteers to give us the equivalent of 30, 35 FTEs, plus or minus. Uh, don't hold any of us to that calculation. What we want to do is keep that incredible strength and richness of volunteer contributions from hundreds of people. Add to it the tech team that Susan Fairley will talk to you about, but also add to it dedicated assigned experts. Could be technical, could be regulatory and ethics. Next slide. So I said, Big Ten from the beginning, it does have this enormous reach. We probably could add alongside scientific community, the real huge uh, opportunity is to link GFGH as it is today and reach much deeper into healthcare. It was part of our strategic roadmap, but this to really uh, fulfill its promise, it can't just be a research or a scientific endeavor. It must reach all the way into healthcare and this concept of a learning health system. Next slide. Um, there was, Harold mentioned COVID, there was mention in the, um, in Slido about phage. And I just want to take a couple of slides. One of our core funders is Canadian Institute of Health Research in their uh, intent to keep working with Global Alliance and finding ways to support this international uh, work in standards and interoperability. They produced a specific focus on COVID response, and COVID-19 response and future pandemic preparedness. They came up with a director grant that GFJH applied for and succeeded in. Next slide. And in essence, because of CIHR, Canadian funding, it was to use these assets, these partners, to link the three data portals that exist in for COVID, some for host, some for virus, in Canada, make sure they are fully interoperable, and then next uh, click start to reach out from beyond those three Canadian platforms into a full international collaboration. Uh, in that, we're proud to be working with Phage, with ICODA, with the, the rest of the, the names you see on this slide. But more importantly, next slide, we would really like to go beyond the people on that previous slide and make this a truly global effort to link the future pandemic preparedness and to help with, uh, with the uh, the important work that still remains to be done with COVID. We are clearly not out of this crisis yet. There's more to be done with COVID and to prepare for the future. We would prefer to do that on a global basis rather than the, just the institutes you saw on the previous slide. So please, please get involved. Next slide. Uh, a few slides on Secretariat. This is, we started with uh, one person nine years ago. We reached by 2020, 11 people, I think there are on this slide, distributed over the four institutes and with strong participation from the group, the CGP group at McGill University. But with the increased funding I talked about, the scaling of GA4GH, next slide. So by grants from the funding agencies to our host institutes, we've been able to expand the secretariat to 22. The largest single build out on this slide is a tech team under the direction of a chief standards officer, Susan Fairley, who's up next. Next slide. So here are the pictures. We haven't, we haven't space to show you all the names. Many of them will be known or many of you will know the, the names and the faces on this slide. But you can see we also have some vacancies. Next slide. So if uh, this is a right point in your career, to join. We've been really good at providing resources and humans uh, to some of our member organizations. It'd be great to have uh, some of you join the GFJ secret Secretariat, be part of this. Next slide. And that is now my great pleasure to pass over to Susan Fairley, who is um, one of the absolute key hires in that last phase of expansion. Uh, we've been talking for several years about the need for a chief standards officer, somebody with a deep understanding of the space and the need for technical interoperability. And it was a great uh, coup for us to be able to recruit Susan Fairley from her role at EBI into the position of chief standards officer. She brings a ton of experience and key aspects that you can read about in her bio. Susan, over to you.
I'm not sure. And I hope you can hear me now. Okay, so thank you very much indeed for that introduction, Peter. Um, it has been my very great pleasure to join J4GH. Um, I've now been in post for six months and it has been wonderful getting to meet people. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. Thanks very much. So as Peter said, um, my role, the Chief Standards Officer, is a new role and it's part of an expansion of the staff team at J4GH. So we now have a number of new roles. Um, one of them had recently filled up Broad and, and actually some others currently open. Um, and the idea behind this is that it will hopefully add additional capacity. So the intention is that these roles are going to be people who are going to be able to work alongside the existing contributor community in J4GH um, and basically provide additional capacity and, and additional support. So we would see the, the aims and direction of J4GH remaining unchanged, but the hope would be that we can use this technical team courtesy of, of the additional funding that we've been given um, to provide extra capacity to take us towards completing the activities and priorities that J4GH has. And if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I think some of you will possibly be familiar with this slide. It, it kind of looks at um, the different activities involved in, in the process of applying genomics in the area of healthcare. Um, and it works from on the left and um, the idea of either a patient or a research participant um, contributing data, going through the consent process, sampling, data generation, data management, um, organisations and institutes looking after access to data through also to researchers looking for data and people working on data analysis, archive data management, and through to things like return of results and applying the findings of that back to um, back to back in, back into healthcare. Um, and if we could move to the next slide, please. This illustrates um, the number of places in this cycle where there are already GA4GH standards in place. Um, and we can see that now there are actually standards in place to support a, a huge amount of this cycle. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, please. So now we're at a stage where we have lots of standards at version one. The next steps for us are to look at moving forward and looking at how we can integrate those standards and get those implementations in place and get, get them deployed so that those things are there and actually in people's environments where they can use them. Um, so looking at both the integration of standards and also implementation. Um, and some of the initiatives within GA4GH that we're currently looking um, at these topics in is we have, for example, a Federated Analysis Systems Project, FASP, which is looking at both end-to-end -end analyses and also being able to move analyses from one environment to another. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that later on. Um, we also have a, a comparatively new entity in GA4GH, the Technical Alignment Subcommittee Task, um, where we're looking at how well our different standards are aligned and looking at resolving some of the kind of detailed issues in terms of interoperability. Um, and then we also have the Starter Kit initiative, which again, we're going to hear um, some more about today after the break, um, when Jeremy is going to talk to us a little bit about that. Um, but the idea behind this is that this should provide kind of simple implementations that people can then start to build on. Um, so if, and we also see, although there's this activity going on in GA4GH, there's also other groups that are putting our standards together. And um, so I think groups such as, for example, Seneca or Australian Genomics, who are starting to pull the standards together and deploy them and, and use them in their environments. And if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. And that's one of the things that's really important for us. We want standards to be able to meet the needs of a broad range of environments. Um, and for that, we need the experience of many people and a broad range of voices and perspectives to be heard. So while the technical team can provide additional capacity for this, we're still going to rely absolutely on the wider community to ensure that we can do this. And if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. And we want to have this breadth of voices and perspectives at all levels in GA4GH. Um, so that goes through to, we would love to encourage um, more people to join our work streams and to participate in, in the, the detailed work of the subgroups, for example. But we're also looking at the leadership of the work stream. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we've recently started a process of talking to um, work stream leads to identify what they think are the important attributes for the roles. And we're now looking at piloting a new process for leadership selection with open nominations because we feel that it's really important that this be opened up as broadly as possible and that anybody be able to put themselves forward for these roles. And the idea behind that is to try to look at how we can build a global leadership team so that we can develop standards that, that are going to work for everybody. 
So I am going to finish there. I think we have, have said that we're in the interest of time, we're going to move forward um, and uh, pass over um, the idea of, of, of doing Q&A with Peter and I right now. So if we could advance the slides, please. Um, and I think we um, now I get the pleasure of um, introducing our next speaker, uh, Laura Pagluoni. Um, Laura um, has a background in history um, in uh, research infrastructure. She currently works as a consultant. Um, she was the founding technical director of ORCID, um, which many of you will be familiar with because it has um, helped more than 9 million researchers um, overcome the issue of, of an ambiguous researcher identity. Um, Laura has made wonderful contributions to GA4GH over the years. She has contributed to our jury, our data use and researcher identity work stream. And she's also now currently doing wonderful work for us um, with our EDI group. And it's on that topic that she's going to speak to us today. Um, so as I say, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Laura. Um, and, and I'm going to hand over to her now. Can you hear me now? Okay, so sorry about that. Um, wrong mark microphone. So um, I will go back to what I was saying before. Uh, the EDI group was established in May 2020 with the goal to increase diversity and inclusion among the teams participating in the GA4GH standards creation process. And we started out back then um, with a rich brainstorm of the areas that we could engage in to increase the diversity and inclusion within the GA4GH community. Um, around the same time, the regulatory and ethics working group was also going through a similar exploration process to, uh, to consider how we ensure that diversity and inclusion is reflected in the standards that we create, which is a key component to the diversity and inclusion in the data, set, data sets themselves. So on the EDI group, we decided to take an intentional community approach. And we specifically considered what the ideal community is that we wanted to have to achieve the GA for GH goals, and then develop processes and programs that help build and encourage and strengthen that community that we want. During last year's plenary, we surveyed the community to better understand where we might immediately focus. And this insight was led to, uh, led to further work that culminated in the Connect meeting in February, where we focused on the projects that would support three areas across the EDI and RUS teams. Um, so at that meeting in March, 2021, the community helped to flesh out the projects in the three um, chosen areas of focus. And so we had the, um, we had the equity and diversity inclusion work, which was reflected both in our teams and in our standards. And we chose three areas in which to focus. The three areas were onboarding, participation level, levels, and equity and by design, which is about equity in our, um, in our standards group. Um, Several projects were identified. You'll see them in the small post-it notes. It's not to show um, what the projects are. I'll be talking about that in just a second. Um, but that was developed through a brainstorm with the community. And um, 
once uh, once we went through that process, we selected um, one of the projects, which is the onboarding contact program, um, as the first area to try out. Um, this program is designed to help newcomers that get oriented. Um, help them to get oriented to projects more quickly and find their connections to find them to allow them to contribute in the areas that best align with their interests. And this program launched uh, this past summer. So a natural question I think to ask is how are things going um, and are our efforts so far making an impact? And to answer this question, I think we might first need to address an elephant in the room. Um, and this is a picture from, uh, from a museum in Washington, DC. Um, as you listen to the distinguished speakers during the plenary, it might be tempting to think that very little has changed in our year of effort that we had so far. And after all, if you attended last year's plenary and you were considering just who's speaking, you might find the group is pretty similar from that of last year. But maybe that's not so surprising. After all, the efforts that we've made so far have been designed to encourage those who are already engaging as active contributors to stay involved and deepen their involvement. But this begs the question, what does one expect when they hear um, that a program is or an organization is working on equity, diversity, and inclusion? Are they thinking of something more like the image on the left? Is, there's diversity in those individual flowers, but on first glance, um, a first glance would emphasize the similarity of color, shape, composition of that bouquet. And I'm guessing more often folks are expecting something more like the image on the right. Here we see a complementary but very diverse set of flowers. The interactions between them is visually rich and um, most looking at it would declare that this bouquet was diverse even with just a glance. Um, but the question is how do you get more a more diverse bouquet when you're talking about the makeup of teams like those that participate in GA for GH. This really requires many sim simultaneous coordinated efforts that together produce a change from doing things the way that we have always been doing them. Um, and it might be useful to consider a tiered model of developing and supporting this community. Um, if you start from the bottom of this very delicious looking cake, um, you, um, you, you you consider the need for community diversity. This tier addresses the reach of our work and represents the makeup of the organizations that are involved, most likely the members of GA for GH itself. Increasing the diversity of this membership is a foundational component to increasing overall diversity. The middle tier considers the diversity of the individuals serving as active contributors. This tier is influenced by those uh, by who um, the GA for GH members choose to actively participate in the work, either in work streams or driver projects. And finally, the top tier is more about the inclusion pieces of it. This is the key area that the EDI advisory group can support. And this piece is about how we ensure that those choosing to engage are able to. The meetings are at times that they can participate, contributions are incorporated appropriately, Individuals are given opportunities to deepen their engagement through leadership and speaking opportunities and so on. Um, the bottom two tiers have the biggest impact on that delicious looking cake. And if you look at how we're doing on the bottom tier, you'll notice there's a lot of homogeneity here. 75% of those participating are sort of in this Europe and North American uh, region. These are the members themselves. Um, I've used the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goal regions as the, as the breakdown here. I know this is not a, a regions that always are used, but I think that they're very helpful, particularly in what we're talking about as, as far as um, diversity goes. Um, similarly, if you look at the makeup of the backgrounds uh, or the, the areas of participation for each one of the organizations that are member organizations, and please note that people, uh, organizations may be put into more than one um, more than one group. Um, you'll see that the diversity there is also not that, uh, that big. There's a lot of homogeneity there as well. Likewise, if you look at the active contributors themselves, okay, so even if we had um, participation across all of these um, organizations at an equal level, um, then at least we'd be like part of the way. But that middle tier is about that piece of it. And you'll notice that of the seven areas about five of them um, don't have a representative participation from um, the individuals in those organizations. 
And then finally, in the inclusion efforts, while it's still early days, we just launched the uh, onboarding participation program just in this summer. Um, but the number of people outside of the EDI groups that are actively participating in that EDI work really is quite small. And it, it's very important to note that this isn't the job of just a committee. This is a uh, this is work that all of us need to uh, contribute to. So I'll just conclude with uh, with these thoughts. Um, what kinds of work can, do you think you can uh, contribute in order to ensure that we have diversity, equity, inclusion within the work that we're doing and the standards that we create? Um, it since it is a, a group effort, this is this is something that we can all participate in. For example, if your organization is not yet participating, you can support the diversity of our standards by supporting somebody on your team to be an active contributor, and and, and consider um, uh, and consider having your organization participate directly in GA for GH as a member. Um, or if your organization has one or more active contributors, consider, consider who they are. Are they individuals in your organization that could broaden or deepen our conversations with different lenses, viewpoints, or skills? And finally, if you're an active contributor, that's great. And um, consider how you can more actively support the inclusion of new viewpoints or lenses and how you can broaden the diversity and inclusion of the more visible parts of our work in leadership, speaking, presentation at events, speaking and highlights, standing in standing group meetings, authorship, and so on. Um, finally, I'll just conclude with um, uh, an invitation to participate in our survey, um, which is similar to last year. Um, it's uh, The link is just listed here, but also an email will be going out after this session. So um, with the link and an invitation to participate. So I hope you will do that. Thank you. And I think we are waiting to see if we have any questions. I think that's correct. <laughs> or <laughs> all we baited breath. I can hear somebody typing somewhere, so presumably they're coming through. So just talk. <laughs> Laura, I, I should just on behalf of GPJ, I really should thank you for everything you've brought to it, your expertise and your energy and your passion. I think really got us off to the, the best possible start. And I, when I thought about that big giant community on my slide, I realized, you know, it's one thing doing EDI work inside an organization. I, I see the work we do at OICR for exists. It, it's concrete, it's tangible. It's much more complicated to do it in 660 member organizations, 24 driver projects, and the vast majority of people with us um, for, as a volunteer. So thank you is my only comment and we will keep uh doing a uh, very best job we can to listen to you listen to others and to really internalize this okay we have a question for you so goal for edi to achieve in 2022 what does success look like um i think as we're moving into 2022 um we're going to be looking at some of the other tiers of the cake and and starting to have conversations um, within GA for GH and, and see how what programs we might be able to put in place there. Um, we have been talking a lot on the inclusion piece of it, also in um, ensuring that we have um, that teams have good uh, guidelines, um, best practices, uh, techniques in order to ensure that there's um, uh, ways that we can ensure that other people can participate, making sure that you know. There's a preamble at the beginning of every document, so a newcomer knows more what this document is for and that kind of thing. Just looking at the, the next two questions, and I think the, the, perhaps the third as well, I'll try and give a comment on the original driver projects. It, very original, the three demonstration projects we started with way back were actually not funded. They were all created as part of GFGH's ramp up 
And in fact, that was one of our challenges. We didn't have well-funded demonstration projects. They were phenomenal demonstrations of the power of data sharing, but not necessarily how best to use GA4J standards. When we made the pivot to the current driver projects, the vast majority are well-funded. And in a, in a sense, that was very deliberate because we wanted them to have the capacity and the capability to be able to input into standards development. Um, the challenge of engaging uh, projects from other countries, low, low, particularly low resource settings, I think is that's where I, I'm hoping that some of the funding we can get through core funders and some of the funding that we can get through voluntary contributions from uh, supporting members will actually allow us to create mechanisms, whether that's fellowships, internships, to engage more people from low middle income country settings. I can comment a little bit on um, the active participation um, question. I think, so of course, if you're going to lead a work stream, that's a very significant um, contribution of time. But I, I think it's possible to be act, an active participant in other ways as well, reviewing a document, um, participating in a poll. Um, uh, it, there's other ways to participate that don't require such a significant, um, I guess, contribution of time, um, but are still incredibly valuable and useful to uh, the standards that we're developing. So um, I think um, maybe what something EDI group can do is help articulate what some of those uh, lower time commitments um, contributions might look like. I think I, I would also add to that. Um, obviously, there's different levels of participation that groups can have, but one of the things which for us is really critical actually is you know, currently we do have this model of driver projects, but to be able to go back to people and check in with them, is this fit for your purpose? And we know the huge amount of time that people who are hands-on in the fine detail of the standards development put into J4GH, and it's an incredible effort. But actually for us to have people who are maybe not even quite so closely involved in the, the fine detail of the development work, but for whom we can go back to and check check in with them and say, does, does this meet your needs? Um, that, that is incredibly valuable to us as well. Um, I also noticed um, we had a, a question here about how do we explore the buddy system um, for members joining. Um, I, I think this is talking specifically about people from less well represented um, regions. I know that the EDI group has been working on an onboarding thing, Laura, I wonder if you maybe We'd like to say a couple of words on that. Yeah, the onboarding program is, it's exactly that. It's a buddy system. Um, uh, it's its designed for individuals that are participating. So an individual who might join a, a particular work stream um, would, uh, would be introduced to somebody who has been in the community longer. And uh, we think of it as a dinner party motif where, you know, it's, you come to a dinner party, there's a, there's people, the host knows all of the people that are there and meets you, learns a little bit about you, learn, knows the people that are in the room and helps make introductions that make that, that um, your, your incorporation into that group uh, much easier because you have somebody to talk with, you know things that you can talk about. Um, that's not done on the organization level though. So I'm not sure if this um, question is about the organization um, body system or individuals, but I think it is in place for the for individuals. Thanks, Laura. And I also, I guess, just to, to jump ahead a couple of questions. Um, I see there's one for Peter and I asking if there are any concerns about having full-time staff members working alongside um, contributors for whom it's, it's not a full-time role. Um, I think at the moment the answer to that is, is no. Um, what we see or what the intention behind the full-time staff is that they should be able to provide additional capacity. So our hope would be that we would still be using um, and benefiting from the expert input of the existing community. So there's no intention that there should be any change there. But at the times when maybe people are, are you know, time is tight, nobody has as much time as they would like. Um, at times when it is difficult for people to get things to completion, maybe, maybe there's documentation that needs finishing off. Maybe a pull request needs reviewed being able to have people who can step in there and help take that work forward, we, we, we hope is, is going to be really valuable to us in being able to move things forward and get things done. And I think there was also another question about our priorities. Um, we want to be able to go ahead and get this infrastructure in, 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 into place. 
Okay, I, we are running slightly behind schedule. So we're going to give uh, thank all the presenters from this opening session. We will get back to those questions through Slido. We'll give written responses if we had names and we know how to get back to people. Um, I, we're going to turn it into what was going to be a 15 minute break is now a seven minute break. So whatever you have to do in the next seven minutes, please do it quickly and join us for the next session. Thank you. Thank you.
introduce the standard spotlight session. Um, and the first um, of the speakers in the session that we're going to be hearing from is Moni Munez Torres um, from the University of Colorado. Um, Moni is a wonderful contributor to GA4GH and she is going to be talking to us today about Phenopackets version 2 and um, the work with that and verse and pedigree. Um, so over to Moni. Thank you. Okay, I think I am on now. Are you able to hear me? Sounds wonderful. And I think we are just passing over to Moni just now. Okay. <laughs> and we seem to be having some technical difficulty, but okay. if you will bear with us, we're, 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 we're going to get this sorted soon, I'm sure. I am being asked to speak to see if the sound is working, so I am speaking. Are you able to hear me? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Monica Munoz Torres, an associate research professor at the School of Medicine in the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. I'm broadcasting today from the United States on land that once belonged to the Soto Yomi, a tribe of the Wapo people in Northern California. With me here today are Alex Wagner and Peter Robinson, and it is my pleasure to speak on behalf of the Pino Packets and Verse teams. As you know, there are standards formats for the exchange of sequences and entire genomes, but until very recently, none existed for the exchange of phenotypic information. So to do this, to do this exchange, we needed computable and case level phenotypes. This is a uh, computable means to relate to form, function, uh, and dysfunction in order to be able to interpret the genome for a diagnosis or otherwise. <laughs> A mechanism was needed for us to be able to exchange this information and to improve on the use of only free text or downloading the entire electronic health record in PDF format. So we put our heads together and created something called the Phenopacket standard that many of you are now familiar with. This is an exchange format for phenotypes and environmental factors, a packet of phenotype data to be used anywhere and written by anyone. And these phenotypic profiles are encoded using ontologies and can also be used to relate a patient's entire profile to model organisms. All of this to help us improve on diagnostics, mechanism discovery, and the integration with environmental health data. Uh, the phenopackets allow us to exchange information about the patient, like identifiers and age of collection, as well as details about each of the observed phenotypes, including whether or not a phenotype was observed, when it was observed, how, how severe, and how each phenotype is linked to a patient, uh, their genomic information, their samples that were collected, and when available, the parents and siblings to the patient. Uh, in the latest version of the standard, we're including improvements to uh, the representation of cancer and COVID phenotypes. And here you can see a simplified overview of the version two of the phenopacket schema, and it was recently approved here at G4GH. Uh, the Phenopacket Center consists of several optional elements, each of which contains information about a certain topic, such as a phenotype, a variant, or pedigree. One element can contain other elements, as you can see, and this produces that hierarchical representation of the data. So, for instance, the Phenopacket element type in, can contain elements of type individual, phenotypic feature, or biosample, uh, and so on. These uh, elements can be regarded as building blocks that are combined to create uh, larger structures. And the colors you see here are just representing the major themes of the elements within the phenopacket. So genomic interpretation over here in red and medical integration over here in green. This is an example of how phenotypic features are represented in a phenopacket. Each phenopacket contains features about a single individual. For medical use cases, a subject will generally be a patient or a proband of a study, and the phenotypes will be those abnormalities that are described by an ontology, such as the Human Phenotype Ontology, or HBO. Each phenotypic feature is defined then by an HBO term, and, and then 
uh, it's it's over here, it, and it's denoted by this URI uh, HP. It shows also the term, that in, and it will be qualified as either being present or absent using uh, the word exclude to be true or false. It also shows the possible severity of the phenotype, so modifiers for onset and resolution. And this example shows the phenotypic features that are uh, expressed in a severe daily infantile uh, spasms, which is uh, first occurred here in infancy and resolved about at four years and two months of age. This is another example, and it shows us how we can encode measurements in this case of platelet count. So over here on the left, we can see there's a graphical representation of the abnormal result uh, of laboratory, and these values are outside of, a range, of the reference range here in the dotted line. This middle panel shows us the relevant hierarchy of the phenopacket element or the building blocks. And here on the right, we show a fragment of a JSON code of the phenopacket representing that information uh, over here. So these results from the lab uh, show abnormally low platelet count, but in general, this element can be used to represent both normal and abnormal measurements. And the reference range in this case represents a range that was applied to the specific investigation. So it may reflect age or sex specific values for some analytes. And this is an example of how we can represent medical actions. We can see the components over here on the, on the expected uh, values or ranges for the medical action, and here an example implementing this structure using, in this case, uh, medical actions. Here the letter A is showing us um, support for that it, it needed a procedure to support a failing heart by means of a left ventricular assist uh, device. And the letters B here and here, on the right, they represent a treatment with two liters per minute of oxygen for two days, and then an increase to 50 liters per minute of oxygen over the next day. And down here, it shows a treatment with uh, six milligrams of dexamethasone once daily for 10 days. So, the phenopackets uh, are going to be beneficial to everybody, to research biologists, physicians, and patients, and providers of, of phenotypic data uh, include patients and clinicians with a variety of mechanisms. Uh, this includes mobile health apps, the electronic health record, uh, and they can create phenotype data in a variety of encodings, CSV, AL format. Uh, in the middle, you can see here that the receivers of the, phenotypic, the phenotypic information could include journals, databases, and registries. And the implementation of the phenopacket can improve the speed and the accuracy of the diagnosis as well as treatment effectiveness. Uh, it can facilitate the cohort identification. It can facilitate uh, patient matchmaking during clinical trials and improve search capabilities by being associated with publications as well as improve the data landscape and facilitate the creation of tools and algorithms uh, as they find their way into databases. We, uh, the phenopackets is developed by the members of the Clinical and Phenotypic Data Capture Workstream, and we were delighted to work with the VERSE team from the Genomic Knowledge Standards to implement deep integration of two GFRGH standards. Uh, one important use case of phenopackets is to support the investigation of genotype to phenotype correlations. Our integration with the Variant Representation Specification, or VERSE, offers phenopackets this computationally precise way of describing genetic variation, as well as the flexibility of human readable variant description formats. We integrated the VERSE schema into the phenopacket, uh, and I'll share more details about this in a second, but the VERSE components of the phenopacket are used as a part of the interpretation element to describe the genetic variant or the variants that are interpreted to be causal or associated with the disease diagnosis or the phenotypic findings for an individual. The versatile is a proposed extension for verse, and it is what supports this human readable descriptions uh, for descriptive data, descriptive data such as a GDS and uh, SPDI 46. And it provides variation and gene descriptors object classes. And the FINA packet standard now leverages these more computationally precise concepts and complements the ability of a FINA packet to hold links to genomic data files, such as uh, VCF, for instance. So in that schema, this is where that part of the genomic interpretation for variants uh, resulted. So this is a detail of the verse variation class, and it's a class that basically sits at the root of all the types of biomolecular uh, variation. It's categorized as molecular, systemic, and, and uh, it also has a collection of subclasses that are used for technical applications. But this variation 
uh, class supports all the verse variation classes, which include the allele, the haplotype, and the copy number. We work together to integrate version 1.2 of the verse JSON schema into the existing uh, phenopacket protobuf schema so that we could replace this initial homegrown variant representation that we had in the first version of phenopackets. And the YAML file specified on the website uh, that I have listed here is the authoritative source of the data from which the JSON schema is derived. However, this JSON schema was the validation artifact originally targeted by the specification. So this transformation from YAML to JSON is only a syntax translation. To make things compatible uh, with protocol buffers, we had to create a new program to process the verse YAML into a compatible uh, that proto definition file. This process uh, involved all of the actions called here, functions to flatten abstract classes, creating nested messages, structures for repeated classes, and leveraging protobuf uh, for that and leveraging protobuf's implicit class types. So please be sure to reach out to Alex and Larry and Peter and Jules or I for additional details. And we plan to support the integration with other GA4GH standards, and it's in, that, in, in, in an analogous way to this. For instance, we plan to, to work with the pedigree team in our work stream for the integration of the family data and to work with the other GA4GH teams to support the full integration of, uh, of sophisticated phenotypes searching uh, in, in, in all of GA4GH APIs. I think uh, awesome. I'm about at time, so we would like to kindly thank you for your attention and for the many of you, I, we would also extend a, a kind thank you for your contributions to realizing the Phenopacket standard. Um, Peter and Alex, I believe, are both here with me and would, we would be delighted to share, uh, to answer some questions. Thank you very much indeed for that presentation, Moni. That was really great. Um, and as you say, um, we have you and, and Alex here um, to, to help um, an answer questions. So if anybody does have any questions um, for, for Alex and Moni, um, please please do send them in. I, I, I think via Slido is, is, is the way to do it. I don't know, Moni, I guess one question from, from me, I mean, in, in terms of the next steps, what, what's the next thing that, that you would most like to be doing with the uh, packets? Or actually, I'm going to cancel that question. I, 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 I won't steal it for myself. I'll, I'll go, go, for, go for one from the, the audience. How do phenopackets relate to fire exchange standards? That's a great question. I am having a little bit of difficulty hearing you, uh, Susan. So I think that you asked how do FINA packets relate to fire exchange standards, the first one at the top? Yes, that's correct. Brilliant. Um, well, we are actually working very, we have been working with the sports uh, support from the National Library of Medicine to be able to export the message, to be able to, to export the phenopacket message and import it into a FHIR implementation guide. Uh, so this has, this has been an incredibly good work by many of you here, uh, but also um, the actually the HL7 FHIR organization um, made phenopackets part of its Vulcan Accelerator project. And so we are very much in tune trying to make sure that we can represent the information that we're able to capture in a phenopacket also in FHIR. And we were to, you know, trying to make that bridge across the representation for the phenotypes in the research environment to that clinical environment. Um, there is a draft implementation guide already out there. So be on the look for us giving you more updates about uh, how those things are working. That sounds great. Thank you very much indeed, Moni. I think that actually in the interest of time, we're possibly now going to move ahead um, to, to Georgie's talk. I see that we do have some additional questions here on Fina Packets, um, but I, I might ask if, if it's possible for us to follow up with those offline because um, th 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 they're great questions and I, I know you guys would be interested to answer them. Um, so it is now um, my pleasure to go ahead and um, introduce Jordi Rambla. Uh, Jordi is involved in the European Genotype Archive. He's based at the Centre for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona um, and is going to be talking to us today about the Beacon API um, along with DERS and FINA packets. Um, so if we could pass over to Jordi, uh, that would be wonderful. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, as you said, this is Jordi Rambla. 
I know that the pronunciation of my name is not so easy for English speaking person. Um, I'm talking here in, also in behalf of the Beacon team that it's a lot of people uh, working on that. Okay? I'm part of the EGA, uh, there's the European Genome Film Archive that it's co-managed by us and the EBI. So we have a great relationship with the Global Alliance in general. So what is Beacon? Beacon, we start to define it as something called a lingua franca. And, and someone suggested that to me. And when I read the definition of lingua franca, I was very, very happy as uh, this is exactly what Beacon is trying to do. A, a lingua franca is a bridge language, something that is adopted by different communities that speak different languages in order to have something, a way to understand each other. Okay? So this has some characteristics. This is, uh, you can imagine that different languages have similar concepts. So they have the concept of a house, a dock, a, a, a car in, in currently, and also uh, they, 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 the lingua franca doesn't need to cover the whole richness of a language that has all the derivative and so on. Okay, so a lingua franca is something that is helping different people to understand each other, and it's useful where it's useful and why it's useful. And this is the goal of the beacon. The beacon is trying to make some communication between projects and existing solution, existing solutions. Uh, easier than it is in the current context uh, of, of the, the state of the things. Okay, so Beacon, original Beacon B1 was approved in 2018, although it was uh, one of the very first projects that the Global Alliance adopted in 2014, and was was designed just to simplify at maximum the way that a genomic variant could be shared, uh, meaning just providing an answer yes or no to a given query. So if you want to know if a given genomic variant is inside a data set, you ask the beacon and beacon answers back yes or no. We enrich it a little bit, the, uh, the beacon responses along the time, but it was clear quite, quite soon that the popular concept of the beacon will require more, will require something that is broader than this genomic Boolean answer and allows the, the querier to get information about the context that this variant is, uh, if it's related to an oncology patient or the sample, uh, meaning the somatic uh, sample or the uh, germline sample, or if it's related to a rare disease, or it's just a population screening thing or what it is, okay? So quite, quite soon it was clear that we need more. And this more was we went, what we call the beacon version two, beacon B2, okay? And when we start to dig this uh, in collaboration with several driver projects, you have them on the right side of the slide, and also with other projects, other partners that are not uh, driver projects, but are also very, very involved, deeply involved in, in the community, uh, we start asking them, what, what do you need for a beacon? Something that it's a lingua franca, so something that is small enough to, to uh, be fit for the purpose, but not trying to cover everything and then you need a whole dictionary, a whole, a whole linguistics associated with it. Yeah? And we end up with something very, very similar to what we describe or name as the clinical genomics research domain. That is something that is useful for clinical research, but many times as it's very close to healthcare, also to healthcare apl applications. And the beacon concept is so simple that many other communities start to show interest in it. So, for example, we had requests from the biobanking community, from the proteomics community, from virology, from plant sciences, and so on, that they, they say, we want to have a beacon. Of course, you see that it's a tension when you have a product that is thought for a specific domain, and you want to apply this product to a completely or a similar but different domain. Okay? So, we, we design the beacon as something that goes on top of existing solutions. You, you see the diagram on the top of the slide, and uh, meaning that if you have a solution with an API, beacon is a perfect fit for that as beacon just consumes the API and it's exposing uh, the information and, and receiving the queries as uh, this lingua franca that I mentioned before. So we have something that is popular and something that wants to be adopted by different communities and also that needs to provide uh, solutions for the clinical genomic research. So we end up with something that uh, is, is split in two sides, uh, two parts. One is what we call the beacon framework, the beacon version two framework, and another is the beacon version two model. The beacon version two framework 
is everything related to how to query and how to get the answers. So how to apply the filters, how to say which entity you are interested in, uh, which is the format of the errors, which is the format of the Boolean answers, which is the format of non-Boolean answers, and so on. So you have to there a semantic if you want a, a, a syntax that you can use. But then the model, meaning the concepts that you see on the right side, meaning cohorts or data sets composed by individuals, biosamples, genomic variants, and the assays uh, used to get to these, to these genomic variants are what we call the model. And we defined one model for Beacon B2, but other models could also be adopting and apply it and using the Beacon framework. So we have then this possibility of using Beacon B2 in different, in different domains while having also a suggestion for the clinical genomics domain that we are interested in, especially in the Global Alliance, okay? So the idea of the Beacon, again, was something that it's small and just used for the lingua franca purposes, meaning that you have different solutions, maybe one solution for managing genomic data in one hospital, another solution in one research university, and you want them to communicate or you want to uh, uh, query both of them at the same time, uh, you use the beacon, you put a, like, you like the beacon on top of both uh, solutions, and then you query the both beacons and you get the answer back just when one single query. Okay? But as we said, uh, the model is small. The model we suggest in beacon B2 is quite small. So, and, and you will see in this slide, okay? Uh, so this doesn't cover the richness of a uh, wool solution like uh, Monica has just shown, like Phenopackets B2 or Fire that has been also mentioned, or Versatile, all this kind of stuff. So at the same time that these standards are moving forward and uh, adding new functionalities, uh, 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 um, evolving them, uh, we want Beacon to be able to keep with this, meaning we suggest one schema, other schemas could be used, and these schemas could evolve at their own pace, while the beacons, the beacon implementers could also cop, cop with, with this evolution of these different schemas. So beacon B2 allows you in the query to request for a given schema that it's not the default schema. If you look at the figure here, you will see a beacon that is the B, the query, and on the right side, you see the void uh, set, meaning the uh, when you don't specify an, an schema, what you will get. So if you ask for individuals and and you don't specify any schema, you will get the beacon B2 model default schema. But if you want to get this information using Phenopackets B2, then you request Phenopackets schema in the query. And if the beacon supports that, it will return you with this, uh, the, the results in this schema. If after tomorrow we have beacon B, uh, sorry, uh, Phenopackets B3, we can then, if the implementer of the beacon has done that, could re return back the information in, in Phenopackets B3 and so on, okay? We have, for example, uh, example, sorry for the redundancy, uh, with fire and mob, so uh, you can return the information in fire format if you prefer that thing, and, and so. So, Beacon is supporting Pheno packets in this way, and also a little secret is that the Beacon B2 individual and biosample, our model, default model, we call it, is uh, broadly based on the Phenopacket V2, preliminary versions of Phenopacket V2, okay? So uh, we have a close relationship also there. So this is one way that Beacon is addressing the uh, support of Phenopackets. In terms of theirs, Beacon V2 is not supporting exactly or is not including the concept of files on it. And DRS, of course, is very is very based on, on, on files. So, but, but Beacon allows for extending a little bit the information that you have so you can include information about the samples, sorry, the files inside the samples or the analysis that you wanna, uh, you, you have in your beacon, okay? So this is an example of an, an uh, teaching or training beacon that we have, this beacon test interns. You can see here that we have a list of samples, uh, just one in this case, because we have queried for just one sample. And together with this sample in the, in, in the top part, you see a small log of a final packet uh, and the word response, when you click on that, you get the information on this sample as a phenopacket. Or if you click on the list of files, you get the manifest of files that are getting back you the list of uh, files that are uh, obtained from this sample, okay? So uh, this way, uh, 
we can provide DRS URLs together with the responses, so you can uh, continue the process of DRS from, from that point on. And if I'm not mistaking, this was the latest slide. So Beacon V2 is a protocol for discovery, discovery the entities, the entry types that are part of the clinical genomics domain, meaning cohorts or data sets if you don't have a cohort, individuals or patients, donors, uh, biosamples obtained from, from these individuals, the assays done with these individuals, meaning <clears throat> wet lab and dry lab assays, and also then the genomic information associated with that, including annotations and all the expected things on, on this type of information. Okay? The beacon B2 then exposes this model when you implement the thing. And if you light a beacon on top of different solutions uh, and different data sets, different data collections, you will get a way for querying just in one single language and get back uh, the information also uh, using these languages and extend, uh, evolve this language or use additional languages when uh, it makes sense because both the client and the server understand this thing. Okay? Another way of saying that would be that there is no reason to use a lingua franca when both the, the both parts of the conversation know another richer language that they uh, control and they understand easily, not like my English, for example. Okay? So uh, that's all. You here you have some links on, on uh, related to places where you can find more beacon information and the contact information and so on. So thank you for, for your attention. And thank you very much indeed, Jordi, for, for, for a great talk. Um, if anybody has any questions for Jordi, I'm going to think we maybe have time for one quick question and um, if they could come through. Um, also, I think I, I would just add Jordi, really wonderful to see um, the progress there with Beacon and also seeing it working alongside um, Durst and Finopak is, is, is just great. So, so we have um, a question here. Um, you mentioned partial support for evolving standards, mentioning Finopakets, Fire and Versatile. Uh, where do implementers identify what parts of these are supported? So how can people find out which elements within those standards are supported? Yeah, this talk is short, uh, uh, hopefully for you, uh, but Beacon is having the model in one side, but there is a lot, uh, a dozen, let's say, of other endpoints that are allowing the Beacon to describe what languages, what schemas understand, what filtering terms it understands, indeed, which entity types have implemented because not all of them will have cohorts or not all of them will have biosamples or individuals. So the beacon is declarative, uh, speaking to the world which things they understand and which things they support and, and all this kind of stuff. Indeed, if the beacon is just answering Boolean questions, it is also allowing beacon B2 or allowing you, according to your uh, authorization level, uh, to get access to the full uh, records that, that the beacon hosts. Okay? Okay, and well, thank you once again, Jordi, for, for a great talk. I see we actually have another question from Alex, but I'm, I'm going to um, ask that, that we maybe follow up on, on that on offline for, in the interest of time. But Jordi, thank you very much in, indeed again. Um, a, a great talk. Um, so now um, it is my pleasure to introduce Sarian Bowers. Um, Sarian is based at the Wellcome Sanger Institute at the Genome Campus, just outside of Cambridge. Um, Sarian is a head of policy at Sanger. Um, and she is also a, a great contributor to J4GH and she is going to be talking to us today um, about passports um, and then we're also going to have Max Barkley um, talking about passports and, and DERS integration. So, so over to Sari and, 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 and Max. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm just going to wait for my slides to come up. Um, but in the meantime, I, as Susan said, I'm Sarah Bowers. I'm Head of Policy at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Um, I am a co-lead on the Passports workstream. Here we go. Um, and perhaps if we move to the next slide, um, I'm just going to give a overview of, um, of what Passports is and why we have it. Um, and so I think probably we all are aware that um, genomic research and as genomics moves into healthcare, data sharing is absolutely fundamental to the development and um, use of genomics. And so, you know, typically what happens is a data um, subject, a data donor in this case, um, will be involved in either a research project or potentially um, in healthcare and their data will be collected and theirs and many others will be um, 
used by a research organization and then ultimately uploaded into a database which at which point much of the data will be made available to um, to the community um, in order to access data there's usually kind of three mechanisms by which you might access data the first is open access in this situation the data is completely freely available open to anybody anybody can get to it this is pretty rare for human data these days. Some of the early genomics projects, you know, really embraced open access. But I think as the technology is developed, data sets have become more complex, and our, you know, we've become much more sophisticated in our analysis. We see this data as much more sensitive, um, and so that really leaves kind of. And so now we put, you know, more safeguards around access. You know, making sure that we know who's accessing the data, why they're accessing it, and that kind of thing. So that kind of leaves us with two other mechanisms. Um, and in the first one, this is you know, something called registered access. So this is a relatively light touch um, access mechanism. Often someone will have to um, present their, you know, some form of identification to show who they are. Um, and it's usually a sort of some kind of click through agreement doesn't necessarily involve a human being reviewing the application. And this is what happens with less sensitive data and, you know, there's an issue, you know, how do you prove your identity is um, is always a sort of big question. Um, and in the in the slide here, you can see that, you know, we've got a researcher clinician wanting to access some data through registered access and she's using her passport. Um, and this is, you know, the passport is basically a way of um, presenting a digital ID with authenticated credentials. And in the example here, you know, she accesses the data using her passport um, but, you know, potentially this might not be all of the data and that, you know, it might be some part of the metadata or just a small sample of it. Um, and then the researcher decides that actually she wants to get the full data set and to get the full data set, she has to go through the other mechanism, which is controlled access. And in controlled access, you have to apply through a data access committee and the committee will review your application. And this process is quite burdensome. So in you know, in a typical data access committee will want to verify your identity. They will want to know what you're using the data for. And so it'll have to match with the data usage restrictions. They'll want to know what organization you come from um, and that you're, you know, it's from an organization that should be um, doing research. Um, and in this, you know, and as we're showing here, in this case, the data access committee is able to um, verify the identity uh, researcher and provides them with permission um, and they're able to access it. And the point of passports is to help with this process. So it doesn't completely automate the DAC process, but what it does is it allows you to provide these kind of authenticated um, credentials, um, including identity and access permissions. Um, and so as an example of a passport, we have um, here, you know, we have the home organization of the researcher confirms the affiliation and the role of the researcher. So that's one credential. Um, and then, you know, elsewhere, the data access committee um, permits access. And so there's another credential is added to the passport. Um, and then you can present this passport to the, to the repository um, and it allows you access to um, the data. And the point of passports is to allow you to collect different um, authentication credentials, these can be potentially linked together um, and ultimately streamlines the, the DAC process. Several organizations have already um, started implementing passports and the benefit really is that hopefully in future, having now got these kind of individual, um, sorry, having passports that, you, that maybe work for one DAC, one set of data sets, Going forward, we can potentially start to automate some of the DAC process, but we can also look at doing things like um, combining it with other GA4GH standards like DUO, so looking at usage restrictions and combining those two things together, um, allowing further automation and potentially, you know, in the future, the ultimate aim would be that potentially DACs recognize each other's um, credentials and so that once a one DAC gives you permission, potentially you're able to go to another DAC and they will accept that permission to get into the data set. And so hopefully the ultimate goal is that we are able to streamline these processes, relieve the burden on the DACs and make data um, access much more accessible. Um, I'm going to hand over to Max now to talk about the integration of
Sorry about that. I assume you can hear me now. All right. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, DURS and Passports integration. So I'll talk just briefly about uh, what DURS is. We've already heard a highlight of Passports and then some work on uh, trying to get these two standards to interoperate together in a, in a more clear way. Um, so a little bit about uh, DERS or the Data Repository Schema. So this is an API uh, for accessing files in the cloud uh, that uh, comes from the cloud work stream. And it's meant to be a uniform way of abstracting away some of the details of accessing metadata and the actual bytes of files across different cloud environments. Um, so we already heard about passports. There's a related standard uh, called Authentication and Authorization Infrastructure, or AAI. And this is sort of the, the underlying technology um, standard that allows for federated authentication and authorization of resources. So a big question uh, when Passport and AAI were released is how can we use these to authorize for uh, you know, resources that are exposed through other GFGH standards, and DERS was an obvious choice uh, to try first. Um, but there are questions about how these two things uh, interoperate that we'll look at in the next slide. So um, we listened to feedback from the community, and particularly implementers and driver projects. And, uh, you know, there were a few major points that came through. Um, you know, one point was that in Passport and AI 1.0, um, there were some ambiguities and it was unclear to implementers where DERS was meant to fit in. So, um, you know, because of these ambiguities, there were concerns that uh, drivers and implementers could uh, implement their own integrations of DERS and Passport. And these, these might end up being different enough that there would be um, incompatibilities between them. Uh, and finally, there was uh, some concerns about some missing abilities to do some offline validation of passports in 1.0. Um, so what steps were taken to resolve these? Well, um, over the last year, we've had uh, many participants in the community from various driver projects and implementers uh, contribute to design documents proposing solutions. Um, in particular, in the Federated Analysis Systems Project, or FASP, we hosted many technical sessions and hackathons to discuss some of these proposals or drive them forward. And over the last month, um, there have been weekly meetings held with a group of uh, you know, interested driver projects and implementers and members of multiple work streams to try and drive these proposals to, uh, to a conclusion. So uh, where does that leave us? Well, there are some concrete changes that are coming to the next version of the DERS specification. Uh, there have been changes merged on how DERS can accept passport tokens that were directly from driver and implementer feedback, and those should land in a DERS 1.2 release sometime soon. Uh, and for Passport and AAI, there's a new proposal in the works for a new token format that directly addresses some of the uh, obstacles and feedback that I mentioned. And the goal is to have this merged into a next version of the Passport and AAI specs. Additionally, because of feedback around ambiguity, we're working on additional supple uh, supplementary text around the standard and diagrams that will help provide more context to implementers around how these standards are meant to be used um, to secure resources like their subjects. And uh, I just wanna say uh, a big thank you to everyone who contributed to these efforts, all of the members of the various driver projects, uh, WorkStreamed and FASP, um, thank you very much for your contributions. And I, with that, I will hand it over to, uh, I think, Susan. So if anybody would like to um, post any questions to Slido, um, we'll be happy to, to take those and pass those to either Sarian or Max. But again, again thank you to both of you um, for uh, your, your presentations. So I think we possibly are taking a moment for Slido to, to come through. Um, okay, um, and oh, wait, not not a question, but a celebration is, is the, the first um, point here, Max, um, people people celebrating that DERS 1.2 has been released. And um, we do, however, have um, 
a question. I'm not actually sure if, if this is one that is possible to, to answer, but um, do we happen to know what's the biggest DERS server around in, in terms of data sets? That's a great question. I unfortunately don't know. Okay, so I, I, I guess that's maybe one for, 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 for the, the conference or for the Slack channel. If, if anybody thinks they know, what is the biggest DER server? Please do post that on Slack and, and we will be really interested to hear about that. And Max, you mentioned um, about, the, about the work in, in, in FASP um, and, and, and a little bit about, about Next Steps. If there is anybody who's interested um, in, in that and how, how that work is developing, what do you see being the, the, the next steps there? Um, yeah, so the first thing I would encourage people to uh, sign up for uh, invitations to the FAST meetings. We meet uh, twice a month. Uh, even if you are uh, you don't think you have the bandwidth to attend regularly, uh, that'll get you onto the email list where um, you can be kept up to date on hackathons we're scheduling and various events related to this and other topics on interoperability. Thank you. And, and a final question. We have a question here about which institutions are currently implementing passports. I believe there are, there are a few of them. I don't know if, if either of you would like to take that. I can take that one. Um, so I, there are a few indeed. Um, so there is Elixir has um, done a lot of work on implementing it. We also have um, NIH and the Autism Sharing Initiative. Uh, and I think each of those implementations has thrown up some unique challenges. Um, it's quite challenging to work with very different systems and so I think I would encourage anybody who's interested in passports and thinks maybe they would be um, be a, a contribution to the, the work stream to come join us. Uh, the work the meetings are open to everybody and we definitely would appreciate the, um, the support from people. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we are exactly on time for the, for the end of, of, of this part of the session. So um, once again, th thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Max, for, for mm -hmm. wonderful presentations. Really appreciate them. Um, and I think the next item on our agenda to move on to is going to be a talk on the DUO standard. Um, so this is going to be a pre-recorded um, presentation um, by Pamela Brecher. Pamela is a student at Clemson University who has been doing an internship um, at the Broad Institute. Um, and I think if we could now pass over um, to Pamela's recording, that will be followed up by Jonathan Lawson, also from Broad, and Jamie Goodry Oval um, from NIH, who are going to be available to take questions on, on, on the GEO standard. So if we could go over to Pamela's recording, please. Hi, this is Pamela Brecher from the DUOS team. Today, I'll be talking about how DUOS leverages the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Standards to streamline the data access request process and plans to leverage additional GA. Today, I'll be talking about how DUOS leverages the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Standards to streamline the data access request process and plans to leverage additional GA4GH standards in the near future. Due to the increasing amount of genomic data, tools to analyze it, and individuals with the skills to do so, the volume of data access requests is rising exponentially. This puts a growing burden on data access committees, known as DACs, to quickly assess if a researcher's intended use of a dataset aligns with the permitted uses specified in a dataset's consent form. On top of this, modern data access requests, or DAR processes, have significant bottlenecks that often delay or prohibit data access. The first bottleneck in the current DAR process is that different institutional review boards, participants, and researchers often use unique and ambiguous language to describe permitted and intended uses of data. This ambiguity, combined with the liability involved in granting and receiving access to restricted data, often leads data access committees to undershare rather than overshare data. DUOS mitigates this problem using the GA4GH's Data Use Ontology, or DUO, which provides standardized data use terms to describe the permitted uses of a dataset. DUOS assigns DUO terms to every dataset to describe its permitted use, 
and to every DAR to describe the researcher's intended use. Having both the dataset and the DAR described in duo terms helps remove the ambiguity between the permissions of a dataset and the intended use of the data by researchers. DUOS makes use of the data use ontology in the data access request application, which can be found on the DUOS website. When researchers complete the application for a dataset, they are required to provide the intended use of the data in both a narrative form and in data use ontology terms. Another step that DUOS takes to ensure clarity of a dataset's permitted uses is to require that the dataset is tagged with the appropriate DUO terms upon its registration in DUOS. These terms are not only human-readable, but can also be converted to machine-readable terms for downstream use of the dataset. Using the standardized terms for both the dataset permissions and intended uses, data access committees can easily determine if the intended research aligns with the dataset's permissions. Additionally, the DUOS matching algorithm can make an instant decision about whether a researcher should be approved for access based on the machine-readable DUO terms attached to the dataset and application. Data access committees can use the DUOS algorithm to inform their final decision, and DUOS team is working to improve the accuracy of the algorithm based on input from DAX to allow for a potentially automated future. In addition to utilizing the data use ontology, the DUOS team regularly promotes the use of the GA4GH machine-readable consent guidance to IRBs and principal investigators when preparing consent forms. The MRCG provides instructions on how these standardized terms can be incorporated into consent forms for a dataset. Using MRCG guided clauses in consents provides research participants with clear expectations about how their data will be used, and facilitates DAX in determining if a researcher's intended use aligns with the dataset's permissions downstream in the DAR process. To help principal investigators and institutional review boards use the machine-readable consent guidance, DUOS also created a beta version of a software tool shown here and is continually working to improve it based on user feedback and updates to the DUO and MRCG. This tool can be found on the DUOS website. In addition to using standardized ontology and the machine-readable consent guidance, DUOS also aims to make use of the GA4GH Passport standard, which specifies the access grants to controlled access data that a user has based on their specific role and affiliation. This provides a standardized way of communicating a researcher's authorizations to expedite the turnaround time for a data access request. Currently, for most data access request processes, researchers must receive approval from their institutional signing official for each individual data access request. To alleviate this burden on signing officials, DUOS allows them to pre-approve researchers to request data access using a library card agreement. For more information, please see our informational video on library card agreements on the DUOS YouTube channel. The goal is for the pre-approval of researchers by library card agreements and the approval of researchers for data access to be stored as a passport specification so that these authorizations can be easily machine-readable. These are just a few of the ways that DUOS is working to streamline the data access process and alleviate burdens on researchers, DACs, and signing officials to allow for efficient access to datasets. Lastly, DUOS is continuously updating our policies and procedures based on guidelines in the Data Access Review Standards Policy and feedback from members of the Data Access Review Standards Working Group. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, please visit the DUOS homepage, check out the DUOS YouTube channel, or contact DUOS support at broadinstitute.zendesk.com.
Today, I'll be talking about how Okay, and um, happily, we don't necessarily need to, to use those channels right now um, because we have Jonathan um, with us here from Broad um, to be able to answer questions. So you also have the option of using Slido. Um, so um, we can take a second or two to see if any um, questions come, come through on Slido uh, for, for Jonathan here. Um, in the meantime, Jonathan, um, there's, there's mention at the, the end of Pamela's talk about, about the work that you're doing with passports. Um, maybe you could tell us a little, a little more about where that's just currently at. Sure. Um, I think right now uh, we're still heavily in the policy side of things. So we're very excited about technical integrations. And I think a lot of the, the folks both at Broad and, and at NIH and, and in the passports working group have really strong ideas about how to make that work technically. I think the biggest challenge is actually a lot of policy agreements about exactly who someone will be um, and, and what the passport can truly represent. So a lot of it is kind of wrapped up in policy. I think the first thing you'll see Pamela mention in the video um, is that we will move to uh, label access grants, which I think the, the folks at NIH who have started implementation on this, that's where they've started as well. So once someone's approved for a DAR, uh, that their passport would then have the appropriate visa to represent that so they could access that data set in a variety of locations. So still early, but uh, we're moving forward. Okay, and I, I'm not, I, I, get, I think you, you may hopefully be able to answer this from the perspective sure. of Broad. It, it may, may, be, it may be a slightly broad question more generally, but um, could you tell us a little bit about, about some of the data sets where Duo has been applied? Yeah, uh, so I can certainly say for all of the data sets that are in Duos right now and are managed by the Broad Data Access Committee, those all have uh, Duo based data use terms assigned to them. Um, I, I don't know the exact number, but I know uh, Giselle and, and Melly and Sari and other folks have been working hard to get um, many of the data sets that are in EGA uh, labeled with duo terms. And I, I know it's very high, and I believe it's now a policy that you must assign duo terms on registration uh, for EGA. And then I know at NIH, uh, there have been, I think, around five to 600 data sets uh, which have had duo terms assigned, which has been relatively straightforward given many of the NIH data use limitations are similar to duo terms. Uh, and there's an initiative to, to kind of go forward and do the rest or as many as possible uh, with the NIH data sets as well. That's wonderful, thank you. Yeah. And I guess an, another question from me, um, Again, we, we heard also, I mean, Saren spoke earlier about the, the burden of effort that there can be for data access committees in terms of managing access to data sets. Mm. Obviously, Duo is designed to help relieve some of that burden of, of access. Um, for people who are interested in this and who are looking at it and, and thinking about, you know, it would be great to have this implemented at, um, you know, at my institute. Um, how do I find out if this is going to match my institutional policy or how, how do I contribute details and information about what, what that is? What's the best way for people yeah. to get involved in you? Yeah, I would, I would certainly say you're welcome to join our DURI Data Use and Researcher Identities uh, workstream meetings. Uh, so, so please come to that. And then myself and a number of other folks have experience kind of uh, with our institutions. And there's a number of points you can get started if you're early on in a research project. Um, it's you know, getting your consent forms aligned so that they very clearly represent duo terms. Um, if this is after the fact and you're thinking about sharing data you've collected maybe a long time ago, there's certain things we can do to help you and, and potentially your IRB or your compliance offices to think about how to interpret your existing consent forms in terms of duo. Um, and then for folks who, who maybe are confident they already have that, uh, if it comes to you know granting access or just making a catalog that's searchable based on duo terms, there are a number of folks in that group who are able to facilitate that as well. Okay, and um, we have a, another question on Slido. Um, somebody asking, do you think there is a use case for some kind of blockchain protocols um, and being implemented? Uh, I, I think I would say in general, I don't know if I am uh, technically qualified enough to answer that. Uh, I, I would imagine there could be things if we're talking about smart contracting and kind of the access to a data set and derivatives of that data set is an interesting uh, problem. But I think we're still, at least on the experience I've had, 
uh, validating if that use case is real. Um, how, how often someone really should be granted to use certain derivatives and, and kind of tracking use permissions. So I, I guess the answer is maybe for now, but we could probably have that conversation in a nice Dury meeting in the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I, I guess what, one of the questions, um, Pamela mentioned, I, I think um, a little bit about some of the tooling that was being developed to help yeah. um, researchers work with this. Um, how, how have you been finding that's been going? How are researchers responding to working with that? Yeah, so it's. I think it's been most helpful uh, when we've been able, you know, folks like Melanie and myself have been able to speak with the researchers. What we're really trying to do is to get it to a place where you can see that kind of beta version of that tool where you don't necessarily need someone who's heavily involved in G4GH to uh, you know, use some guidance documentation or a simple software tool. And that has really pushed us uh, along with a number of others in, in the Dury group to consider um, more straightforward terms and definitions uh, to represent the existing duo terms uh, and just how we would do that. So I think that's something that's coming up uh, probably as an agenda item in our next meeting is, is what are more straightforward uh, user-friendly terms for those. And I think that you would see that in that tool in the future um, if we go forward with that as a group. And that, that sounds like potentially um, also really useful to get the feedback from the researchers working with that to, to, to feed exactly. in the form. Exactly. And, okay. And, and I, I'm guessing that also in turn means that you'd be very happy to get volunteers from driver projects getting in touch to, to try that. Certainly. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. We, we're looking for, uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing is compliance, uh, sufficiency, and also UI efficiency. And so it's it's the, the blend of those two to represent the duo that we're gonna hunt down, I think. Okay, and I'm gonna squeeze in one last question here. Sure. Somebody has just, just asked, if someone wanted to get started with the duo, what would you suggest? What would be the first steps? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, you can check out our uh, GitHub, uh, certainly for some early documentation, and by all means, come and join the Dury Workstream meetings. Uh, everyone that is actively involved is, is really helpful, really willing to volunteer some time uh, to help you get started. So we'd love to help you guys out. Okay, well, Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for um, taking questions on this. We really appreciate sure. your involvement. Thank you very sure. much indeed. Um, so I think next on our schedule, um, we are going to be having Miro Kupak from DNA Stack is going to be talking to us about the Data Connect API. Um, Data Connect is, is one of the newest standards in J4JH. Um, so I am going to um, ask that we now hand over, please, to Miro, um, and, and let Miro talk to us about Data Connect, if that's possible. Thanks. Oh, thank you, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Miro Tupac, and together with Aaron Camp, I call it Data Connect. Data Connect is a new standard from the Discover Workstream of GA4GH, approved just a few months ago. And it's a standard defining a very simple but flexible protocol for discovery and searching of not just genomics, but pretty arbitrary data types. Um, data Connect is a relatively technical protocol, and it provides two key functionalities. It gives data custodians the ability to organize their data into what we call tables, and it allows them to describe the data in its data model. And when we talk about describing the data, we really mean describing it semantically, capturing the meaning of the data. So as a data custodian, you can say things like, this attribute in my data set is a string, but you can also attach more semantics and say that this attribute is a blood type as defined by a particular ontology, for example. Importantly, Data Connect does not define the data models that you have to use. In other words, we're not telling you what a blood type looks like. Instead, we're saying that you, as a data custodian, just tell us what your data already looks like, what your current model is, and we just give you the tools to describe it using JSON schema as the format. Of course, if you're not tied to a specific model that you already have, or you want to use something standard, we integrate with other GA4GH standards that provide this. So you can use, for example, Pino packets or other emerging efforts in GA4GH, such as schema blocks or computable cohorts. But using such a standardized model is not a prerequisite to sharing over Data Connect. It works with any data that can be viewed as a collection of JSON objects. So any tabular or document data, including nested fields. Once a data custodian describes uh, the data like this, the standard allows data consumers to construct very flexible queries and search this data. We don't introduce our own query language here. Instead, we rely on SQL, arguably the most popular query language in the world. And it's worth noting that while SQL is traditionally associated with relational databases, uh, we only use it as a query language here, and we're not tied to relational databases or other specific storage technologies. In fact, implementations of Data Connect on top of NoSQL stores already exist. So Data Connect is a pretty thin layer on top of other standards. It doesn't prescribe a data model. It doesn't say what we're sharing over the API. It just defines how we do it. 
So it only adds these two simple things, a way to describe a data model and a way to search data with the given model. Data Connect preserves and communicates semantics. It allows you as a data custodian to describe the meaning of your data. It's flexible. It allows you to share virtually any type of data without having to perform potentially expensive transformations to a particular model. So it lowers the barrier to data sharing that way. It's minimal by design. We've really tried to standardize just the minimal functionality we needed to accomplish these goals. And it was designed with federation in mind. So you can have searches federated across different data kind of implementations, potentially in different organizations, and they might share a data model or parts of it. And finally, it's general purpose. The API really came from the need for a standard for asking more complex multimodal questions. And there's a set of use cases we've designed it for, but it's data independent and supports flexible queries, which makes it suitable for solving other use cases that we maybe haven't even thought of yet. Now, because the API is so flexible, let's make it a bit more tangible and take a look at a particular implementation it has enabled. At DNA Stack, which I'm affiliated with, we've spent a part of the pandemic implementing a solution for viral surveillance, specifically applied to tracking variants of SARS-CoV-2. And the software enables sharing of viral genomes and other data through a series of GA4J standards. Among other things, it contains a graphical data explorer based on Data Connect, which is also a part of this year's federated analysis and systems project demonstration coming later in the agenda. So if I just played a video here, um, you can see briefly that viral AI actually aggregates many collections of different types of data, and uh, each consists of a set of Data Connect tables backed by data sets from different data stores across different public clouds. These data sets have a completely different schemas. Many of them are public data curated by various institutions outside of our control. But thanks to the fact that Data Connect doesn't prescribe a specific data model, we were able to connect them as they are into this unified interface. The application uses Data Connect to discover the underlying data model. It renders the filters that we see on the left sidebar for specific types according to the schema it finds. And in the background, it constructs SQL queries based on what the user puts into the filters to send over the Data Connect API. And in this case, we were asking it to give us information about samples collected by a particular site up to a particular date in this collection of data. And we saw that at the end that there's also a corresponding common line interface that allows researchers to create more complex custom queries. So this is sort of an illustration of a basic use case. We've worked with driver projects like the Autism Sharing Initiative and Cancer Research Data Commons. And what they're using this for is giving the data consumers, the researchers, the ability to ask the questions they want, not a predefined set of questions, and giving them the ability to discover two potentially not harmonized but related sets of data, review their schemas to understand the biological meaning, and then merge the data through an appropriately federated query. Another way to look at Data Connect is as this middleware between sources of data and higher level applications. What we have on this slide at the bottom in the yellow boxes are data sources like relational databases or BigQuery or hosted spreadsheets or CSEs. And what we have at the top in the green boxes are applications like Beacon, Jupyter, or Notebooks, Data Explorers, and others. Each connecting line on this slide, each pairwise connection represents a software project. These data stores don't have a common API and the applications are built on different technologies. So there isn't a common language they can speak to each other. So if you make a data explorer and you want it to read a CSV, for example, you need to write that connector or find one somebody already wrote. And if you have a beacon or another explorer and you want it to talk to a Fina packets file, you'll need another connector for that. But with Data Connect, this picture gets much simpler. You no longer need to write a connector for each application data source pair because Data Connect is this common language that everybody can speak. So now if you have a data explorer and you want it to talk to any of the data sources at the bottom or all of them, you only need one connector uh, to Data Connect. And the good news is that everything that's on this slide already exists. The Data Connect group has, implementing, has implemented all these lines, albeit some of them only as prototypes, but you can get all these connectors out of the box. And we're actively working on expanding this ecosystem further. When we talked about the two components of the API, tables and search, what I didn't mention is that you can implement Data Connect just by describing your data. You don't need to implement searching. That endpoint is actually optional. And thanks to this, you can actually implement the API without writing any code. All you need to do is export your data as JSON, write or generate a corresponding schema, put your data into a specific directory structure to mimic the API endpoints, and put it in a cloud bucket or a web server. And this is the easiest way to share over Data Connect. All you need is a few set of files. As a data custodian, you have other options, of course. We host the public Data Connect instance on top of BigQuery. So if you just want to get started with Data Connect, just let us know and we can get you set up very quickly. We also have an open source reference implementation available. You can get started in a few minutes. And this implementation is built on top of Trino, which is a very popular and mature open source analytics project. 
And of course, you're free to create your own implementation of the standard from scratch if you want to. The API is simple, and because we're relying on SQL, you benefit from a very large ecosystem of compatible tools and libraries. So by design, there are sort of different maturity levels to implementing Data Connect. It's arguably the simplest way to share data. The cost for basic publishing is very low. If you just have some loosely tabular data like a CSV or a JSON, and you don't have anything more than the names of the columns really, you can make this data available and searchable through a common API with very little work and even no code. And yes, it's not perfectly harmonized or semantically described, and there is a certain amount of, of work on the consumer side to account for that. But the data is out there, the community can explore it, and that's already a big win for data sharing. And of course, if you are a data custodian and you are willing to put in more work, you can create more value. You can describe the meaning of the data uh, either as a portion of your fields or the entire data set, which makes it immediately more usable for research, especially when cross-referencing with other data in a federation. And you can do this gradually over time. So you can start simple, just expose the data, then capture more and more of the semantics, increasing the value of the data over time as it stays available. And ultimately, you can go all the way. You can harmonize all your data, make it use a standard data model, which is significantly more work on your side as a data custodian. And not everyone can afford doing that. But that way, you're providing the most value uh, for the data consumers, and you get sort of a perfect federation. But even if you do very little and stop at this first step, there's already a lot of value in that. Anyway, as I mentioned before, the first release of Data Connect has been recently approved, and we're now at the stage where we're focusing on increasing adoption. Uh, we're developing new tools and working with several groups on helping onboard them onto Data Connect. And if you think you have a use case and would like to explore it further, whether you are a driver project or not, please reach out to us, and we'll be very happy to work with you. To that effect, GA4GH October Connect meeting is coming up, and there will be an opportunity to dive a bit deeper into the technology. So please join us there. And you're also welcome to join our regular biweekly conference call. If any of this sounds interesting, please reach out to Alice, our registry manager, myself directly, and we'll go from there. And otherwise, thank you. And uh, let's take questions. So Miro, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, and I see people have not been slow um, with this one. Um, we have, have, have already have our first question on Slido. Um, so the question is, does Data Connect support data harmonization and or search across non-harmonized data sets? Yes, that's a good question. So Data Connect certainly supports search across non-harmonized data sets. That was, uh, that was done by design. We want, you to be, we want it to be very easy for people to get started with. Uh, in terms of providing specific tools for data harmonization, we're basically at the level where we're integrating with other standards. So if you're adopting a model, you know, such as a FINA packet or maybe a schema block, we're able to refer to that. But there isn't a lot that we currently provide as part of the standard itself. OK, thank you, Miru. And we, we have a few more questions have come in. So um, next one is, if Data Connect relies on JSON, how, how scalable is that? And, and the, the questioner is thinking in terms of cohort genotype data. Yes, that's a good question. I don't know how I would quantify scale because it just, especially with such a flexible API, it depends on uh, so many things. Um, I would say that so far we haven't hit a scalability issue that we haven't been able to resolve as part of the implementation, like without affecting the standard. But I will say that we, we have gotten one request uh, in our issue tracker for uh, essentially an index into a data connect table uh, rather than just simple sequential pagination as as a way to to scale uh, a bit further. Okay, thank you very much. And th there's an, another question here. Um, uh, does Data Connect allow sharing of data and metadata? Uh, yes. So Data Connect doesn't distinguish between data and metadata essentially. So whatever you whatever you put in your file or whatever you put into your table, you'll be able to to expose and query it through Data Connect. So this is really just a question of how you organize your data. Uh, but yeah, any any data type would be supported. OK, thanks. And um, an, another question, um, does there have to be a standard agreement on the description of the data? So, so, so to what extent, what does Data con Connect expect in terms of, of, of kind of a, a standard? Or what does need, needs to be there for Data Connect to recognize a data set? Yeah. So. Um, Basically, in terms of describing the data, what we rely on is just uh, JSON schema references to, to a model that you provide or an external model. There isn't really a lot more beyond that. So we were, for example, able to reference a schema blog. We were able to reference uh, a schema from a fire server because they were all specified in JSON schema natively. 
So it really just about having a, a JSON schema and conforming to, to the way they reference things. Okay. And we have another question here, which is about the relationship between Data Connect and Beacon. And the, the question is, how do Data Connect and Beacon overlap, integrate, or complement each other? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, so Data Connect and Beacon, they don't really compete with each other. They complement each other. Uh, you can, for example, build a beacon on top of Data Connect, and we have done that. Um, there are differences, however. Uh, most notably, I would say um, Beacon has an API that allows you to ask a very specific question. is is a lookup for a very specific mutation on a specific position, and it comes with a data model. Uh, data Connect, on the other hand, does not come with a data model. You describe your data as it currently is, and it doesn't limit you to a specific question. We actually want researchers and data consumers to be able to specify arbitrary questions. So I would say if you if if, if you're trying to decide what to implement and you're in a position where uh, you want to expose information that's compliant with the Beacon API, that is the question that you want people to ask, and you don't mind. Uh, converting your data model into the one that Beacon already uses, or you're already using the data model, then Beacon is going to do a better job in answering that question because of all the harmonization and all the extra work that they're doing. If you want to allow researchers or data consumers to ask arbitrary questions, or if you're looking to expose data that doesn't necessarily conform with the Beacon data model, then maybe data kind of is a better choice. And then things can be interesting. You, know, you, you can sort of combine them in arbitrary ways, maybe Maybe you're implementing multiple APIs, or maybe you're, let's say, a beacon and a matchmaker. And in that case, you might leverage Data Connect as sort of a middleware layer between the two, just to benefit from the ecosystem of tools that surround it. Or it might even turn out that just if you're implementing a beacon, there's already a respective connector for Data Connect. So you might decide to build a beacon on top of Data Connect and just, just leverage that software. So you can combine it in multiple different ways, but they don't compete, they, they complement each other. Okay, well, Mir, thank you very much indeed for answering these questions. I suspect we may actually have some more that we haven't got to, so I will suggest that people follow up on Slack if they have more questions. But but thank you very much indeed for the, uh, a great presentation. I think in the interest thank of time, you. we're now going to move on um, to our next two speakers. Um, so we're going to have James Bonfield um, from the Wellcome Sanger Institute. James is going to be talking to us about updates um, to the CRAM standard. And then we're also going to have Albert Smith from University of Michigan, who's going to be talking about work that's kind of recently been re relaunched, um, looking at um, scalable VCF and, and, and how VCF format can potentially be scaled. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to hand over, I think, to James, um, who is going to be talking to us about CRAM. So hopefully we should, we should see James and his slides pretty shortly. The, uh, the introduction. So uh, we need to first of all look at where we we got to, to before we can see where we're, we're going. And uh, CRAM CRAM comes into fruition around about 2011 2012 at the EBI, and then jointly in conjunction with the Sanger, it undergoes a number of uh, fairly rapid updates. But since 2014, CRAM has not actually changed. It's been a very stable format. What has changed, however, is the data. So um, the earlier Illumina data had 40 different discrete quality values, for example, and then with high seek, it's quantized down to four and Nova, uh, to eight, and Nova seek quantizes it further down to four. And the algorithms that were designed in the early versions of CRAM don't work as well as they could do on this more modern data set. Hence, we're looking at CRAM 3.1. So to understand actually what's changed and how this how this fits into things, CRAM is a, a, a set of containers, each of which hold uh, a group of reads, say 10,000 records. And those records are broken down into a series of blocks. So we may have a block of read names, a block of quality scores, or a block of barcode tags. And those blocks in turn are compressed using a fairly off-the-shelf compression codec. So this may be GZIP, BZIP2, or LZMA, for example. The only thing that changes with CRAM 3.1, the format is completely identical, but the bit that changes is we add additional compression codecs. And these are designed with a specific data type in mind. So we may have a, a, a codec for compressing read names and another one for compressing quality scores. The effect of this can be seen in these two plots here. So on the left, we've got the encode and on the right, we've got decode. And this is showing uh, the trade-off between time versus size. 
Now, each of these lines represents a different uh, format, and the data points on it is sort of that, like GZIP minus one to GZIP minus nine. It's that trade off with a uh, high, high compression but slow versus low compression but fast. And you can see that BAM is very much an outlier here. It's, it's uh, quite fast. In fact, it's probably the fastest of decoding, but it's also very large. There are many programs which are, or many formats which are much smaller than BAM. Some of them, in fact, are even smaller than the current version of CRAM, but they are also much slower. So with CRAM 3.1, the question we asked ourselves is, can we improve on our compression and be, be uh, once again the, the, the leading compression but without incurring that penalty on time? And the answer is very much clearly yes. This dark blue uh, blue line in the corner is CRAM 3.1. And we can see it's uh, it's further down this size axis than the previous version. Now, this is old Illumina data, more modern Illumina data, so the Novasig data is a very similar picture. The only thing really which has changed here is that the gap between BAM and everything else is even broader. It's, it's now gold. And CRAM 3.1 also is as big a change, if not larger, over the previous version of CRAM than it was in turn over the, the one before that, over 2.1. So hopefully um, you can now see that CRAM 3.1 is uh, it's the next step. It's not a large piece of work. It's, it's just uh, targeting a very specific part of the file format. Um, we do not need a complete new redesign and a new file format to do this. We can just just fix the bits which are not quite as optimal as they could be. And we still have this ideal trade-off of uh, speed versus size without, without incurring too much CPU. At the moment, it's in, it's in draft. It's available in the current version of SAMTools and HGS lib. Um, when we get a second independent implementation, it will move out of draft, hopefully, and will become the next full version of CRAM. And this will happen in HGS JDK soon, I hope, they now have um, staff hired to do this piece of work. So uh, ideally, this, this uh, shouldn't be too long in the future. Now, there is one slight uh, fly in the ointment, which is long read data. So all this work so far you've seen was uh, short read data. Long read data is actually very hard to compress because the quality values and various other fields in the data files are quite noisy. And in fact, um, PacBio, for example, has over 90 different discrete quality values. Now. I would argue, do we really need this degree of uh, precision in the quality values? I don't think it's for us, for GA, for GH, really to dictate what the companies do. But I would uh, suggest maybe the, the platform manufacturers should uh, consider whether they wish to do a similar thing to Illumina and quantize or smooth or do some transform on that data. That's all I've got to say on CRAM. Um, if you wish to see more, there is a preprint or a paper. Uh, but until then, I'll hand over to um, the BCA. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, I had a slight microphone issue. Sorry. Hi, I'm Albert Smith, and I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the VCF uh, file format and, and where we're looking to take it in the future. Oh, and uh, excuse me. And so the VCF format or variant call format was developed for the Thousand Genomes Project, and it's a tab delimited format for storing variant calls and individual genotypes. It's been around for more than 10 years, and it's been very, it's very commonly used, and it's very been excellent for what it was originally designed for. And it often includes information on read depth, gen genotype likelihoods, genotype quality, and other details. And, and just... Just for point of mentioning, there's also a binary compressed equivalent of, of VCF, but it only does a very moderate amount of compression versus a, you know, because VCF is a, a, a text file, it can itself be compressed and indexed, but the BCF is, is moderately smaller than a compressed VCF. And the current VCF specification is version 4.3, and I have a link there to, to point what's available in the spec. But there is one major issue that, that's come up in recent years with uh, VCF in that VCF exhibits very super linear growth with sample size. And the reason for that is that, uh, that VCF stores a full uh, locus by sample matrix for, of genotypes. And it, that's very inefficient with rare variation because the large majority for rare variation for most samples in, in a, a VCF would then be marked as uh, just as the reference allele. 
And so for, and this is in, in part becomes an issue because current cohorts can be well over 100,000 samples and making VCF files very difficult to man manage. And because of that difficulty to manage, they often are uh, discarding information. They may be discarding information on the genotype quality or uh, other metrics, genotype depth, because it's just unmanageable to, 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 to do that. So it becomes not efficient format for sharing all this information that may de be derived from the sequence, like. CRAM is, is just there. So that the initial discussions on this issue on the VCF size, size began with the uh, large stream working group in 2018. And, and at that time and, and subsequent discussions, an, a, a, a large number of very good user stories were developed that weren't, you know, uh, there are other issues with VCF beyond just the, uh, the, the size growth, but that they came up with a number of issues where VCF could be improved, including most notably at the top, better scaling for, for large populations, improved phasing, uh, distinguish, distinguishing no data from no variation, uh, merging samples from multiple VCFs, and and then and then um, should probably you can you can look these over, but there's also some a couple of important points at least to me near the bottom there, which is the efficient subsetting by cohort and efficient subsetting by locus, and that becomes important when we're thinking about you know how we do that because you if you want to make a synthetic cohort or look at a particular region, being able to work with a single file and go there might be a very important thing that a lot of people actually want to be able to do. And so, you know, the, 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 we had these wonderful user stories and, and we started, you know, discussing them and that we even presented and talked about uh, several promising approaches and presented and that benchmarking was, was planned as the next key next step. But that with the work actually became bottlenecked because of data access issues. We, we, we intended to work with uh, a common set of data and there's no publicly available large se uh, sequence data set that's available. Uh, we did have a plan to access the UK Biobank exome data. It's actually timely to even say that today. Today, the UK Biobank is actually making 300,000 exomes available exactly today in, the, in their online platform. So it's sort of appropriate to even be mentioning that right now. But that, um, that you know, so it's sort of, we got sort of stuck with this issue of data access and having appropriate data. So that we, we sort of, we just sort of, in, earlier this year, decided let's reboot, start again. We're starting from zero, even though we had a lot of experience and, and try to move forward quickly. And so that we rebooted the group and, and had our first uh, call with this rebooted group in June. And, and we particularly reached out and targeted key stakeholders, including the individuals from large cohorts, sequence centers, and tool developers, because we want to have multiple different perspectives on how we actually move forward. And so in the, in the the now that we've had, I believe, had three calls since uh, because we have a monthly call, um, that uh, with, that we've actually had several presentations on various solutions that people have had to this to this issue because there are a number of solutions out in the wild where people have made their own solutions, uh, but that there's no community consensus on on what the best way forward. And some of the solutions that we've heard from is uh, Hale and the representation used within it, within Hale, um, and then Savvy. Uh, which we, we actually work on the University of Michigan, which is just uses sparsely stores the data, and then also representing VCF in Czar, which is a data storage mechanism in Python. But the, you know, the, just to get a, a breadth or understanding that of what's going on, we're, we've also begun revisiting the user stories. Um, and then we're also now planning the benchmarks to uh, evaluate the various proposals that may come forward, so maybe the ones we already have, plus additional ones. And that we're also very keen because of the data access issues to make sure that we add simulated data to evaluations because that will enable us to much more easily or better have common data to compare uh, things. And the other thing is that we now have a, a approved project with UK Biobank after whatever problems that we had getting that forward before and um, so that we can actually go back much more easily to go there. So, and, and whoops, and then I skipped the slide. So that, so that you know, what are our next steps where we're going is we're going to complete the landscape analysis of what there is out there of scalable genotype storage. We are going to refine the genotype, the uh, user stories, stories, and then we need to define the data and benchmarks that we're going to use potential solutions and evaluate the pros and cons of options. Because if you're thinking about the, the, the things, the issues that I brought up in user stories, not necessarily all of them are actually compatible. You know, for example, you know, simultaneously having efficiency for subsetting by, 
by uh, locus and cohort, you know, that that may or may not be an achievable goal. You know, are you just using the files for transfer? There's all kinds of different issues that we need to understand what are the optimizations that we should be targeting in terms of a, 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 a format that could be used for genotype transfer or, or, or storage. And so that, which may come down to do we come back and just make an entirely new format or adopt an existing format or somehow even perhaps figure out ways to actually refine uh, VCF as it stands so that, that it becomes more efficient with large cohorts. And so that, you know, this, so we're, coming with all this is that what we're expecting or planning is to then uh, propose the next iteration of what VCF is. And, and so in and, and closing, I'd like to just say that we have, I, we've had a really great engagement from a wide variety of, of individuals. And I've just put up some logos of where the various people that have joined us have been are affiliated with, and and so that you know we have we have a, a hopefully a lot of momentum and we that which we'll be able to maintain. As I say, we do have a monthly call, and if anyone's actually interested, we're still encouraging new participation and and, and, and ideas and and how to, to deal with this. Please reach out to me or Oliver or Thomas. And, and, and the, the minutes, even from the more recent minutes, as well as going back, are all uh, linked to from the large uh, stream, large scale genomics work stream and available on the website if you want to read up more. But I certainly encouraging and, and have uh, people join us as, as they may wish. And that's all I hope to say today. So thank you very much indeed, um, Albert and James, for those presentations. And if anybody has any questions, I think we have maybe time for maybe just one or two. So um, if anybody does have a question uh, for, for James or Albert, please do put it in Slido. Um, and James, I'm going to ask you a question. I was really interested in seeing um, the, the difference in the different data types in, in CRAM. How, how big an impact do you see um, changes in, in, in the underlying data types having in, on, on CRAM in, in future? Oh, and I, I think we may have James on mute. I'm currently not. Okay, that's I can uh, hear you now. Now. Hopefully. Um, yeah, I mean, it does depend on the instrument type very much. Um, so it was it was quite it was quite clear when Illumina shrunk to the to fewer quality values that actually we could do a much better job of improving the compression if we switched algorithms. And there were even algorithms that Vadim Zalanin, who, who sort of designed some of the early parts of CRAM, had considered and rejected, actually, because they didn't work on the data at the time. So it can be rather hard to judge what's going to happen in the future. But the more um, algorithms we have and the way, the way it works, I think it is getting more flexible. So hopefully, uh, when we get new things coming at us, we'll be uh, able to improve further. Um, but, but, overall, it's a Cram frequent ones about between 10 and 20 percent smaller than the, the predecessor, but it does depend very much on the data set. And for for, for ONT and Pat Bio, it's maybe only one or two percent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that sounds like a great saving. Um, I, I think a lot of people will be interested in that. And Albert, thank you also very much indeed. It's great to see so many people involved. And I know that if anybody else has been listening to this and wants to get involved, you'll be very welcome to, to join those uh, future VCF calls. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we sadly have to move on. Um, but again, James and Albert, thank you both very much indeed for your presentations. Um, this is actually the final presentation um, from the Standard Spotlight session. Um, but we're now moving on to have a couple of short presentations um, talking about FASP, the Federated Analysis Systems Project, which is this initiative in GA4GH that seeks to bring together um, different standards. And then we're also going to have a very short presentation on Starter Kit, which is the idea of these kind of simple implementations that people can use to get up and running quick, quickly with the J4GH standards. Um, so at this point, I would like to introduce um, the speakers um, for FASP. Um, so we again have Max Barclay um, from DM. Oh, did we lose Susan? I think she got cut off. Uh, I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. <laughs> Uh, so, hi everyone, I'm Brian O'Connor. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Ian Four and Max Barclay. And we're going to tell you a little bit about FASP and what we've been up to in our Federation demos. Um, so, can we go ahead and have the slides? Sorry, apologies, we're just getting the slides going.
Okay, Max, I think is going to go ahead and rejoin. Uh, Max, do you want to see if I can screen share time? Oh, we've got screen. Okay, awesome. Great. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide then. All right. So for those of you that are curious about FASP, um, FASP is the Federated Analysis Systems Project. Um, and we've really been doing this, this effort for the last year and a half or so, uh, two years, coming up on two years. And FASP is all about showing GA4, GH APIs being used in concert. So how can they be used uh, across systems uh, to enable scientific use cases and real world work? Uh, so the way that we actually work is uh, we, do two, we do three things. We bring together people in hackathons. These are implementers. These are API uh, creators, standards creators. Uh, we work on demonstrations that are rooted in scientific use cases. So we talk to researchers, we work with implementers, we work with the API um, uh, work streams. And then those two activities really lead to the third activity, which is API feedback. So collecting information from real world experience and giving that back to the work stream. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do our demos work? Well, we've oriented them around the concept of vertical and horizontal demos over the last year. And each of them have their own role in the vertical demos. These are showing many GA4, GH APIs working together in concert. So this is interoperability between GA4, GH APIs and a complete end-to-end -end system. And so Max is gonna describe um, a DNA stack-based vertical demo um, in the next section. Uh, next slide. Horizontals are a little bit different. Horizontal demos will look at uh, the same API or subset of APIs across many different implementations, right? So this is looking at interoperability across implementations, across systems. So we're gonna see an example of this with EN and various NIH systems that have implemented DERS and other APIs in the section after Max's uh, demo. Um, I will say that these demos have been incredibly useful for collecting feedback on things like Passport and DERS and other API standards that have fed back to the, the work streams. So with that, uh, Max, I'm gonna hand it off to you for the Vertical Demo 2021 edition. All right, awesome, thank you, Brian. Uh, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk about the uh, 2021 edition of our vertical demo, which is uh, you know, an update from what we showed last year. And this year, this demo is gonna focus on a full use case of data discovery and access that uses Data Connect for accessing tabular data and the data repository schema or DERS for accessing file data. So uh, unlike last year though, uh, we're gonna be showing this use case from two different perspectives. So as before, we'll show a researcher accessing the data via G for GH APIs. But um, this year, we're also going to show what it looks like for a data custodian to enable APIs on top of data that they've previously loaded into the cloud. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So the platform I'll be showing this in is called Viral AI. It was mentioned uh, by, by Miro, my colleague in the, the Spotlight standard. And this is a platform that DNA Stack is working on for providing researchers with curated collections of COVID-19 data. Um, so the researcher side of this is a web interface for data discovery and exploration. And importantly, all of the data access is done through GA4GH APIs. All right, so um, the other part of this, if we can go to the next slide, is a separate UI for data custodians that allows them to enable GA for GH APIs on top of the data. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is an API for data custodians that will allow them to access um, GA for GH data. It seems like the slides have changed. We can go back to the other screen, please. Apologies for the technical difficulties, folks. So just give it a second to see if we can get the slides back. All right, fantastic. Um, so if we can advance to the next slide, please. All right, um, so on this screen, I'm gonna show the first of a series of short video clips. Um, and in this one, we're showing the uh, beginning of the data custodian experience where uh, a, a custodian can create a data source for a cloud resource to load it into this platform. So data sources are things like uh, 
cloud buckets or databases that contain tabular data. Um, and once they're loaded into the system, we'll be able to enable GA for GH APIs on top of them. So if we can advance to the next slide, please. And hopefully that video will start playing. Oh no. Uh. Well, uh, 10 more technical difficulties. Um, maybe we can try to allow me to screen share again, because otherwise this presentation isn't going to go very well. Uh, okay, no, it's still not working. Um, well, maybe we can go back to sharing the slides uh, and talk about the horizontal demo, because uh, I don't think we'll be able to show those clips and finish this segment. So apologies for the technical difficulty, folks. There is a link in the slides to the full video, um, so I'd encourage people to watch that. Um, but for now, if we can bring up the slides again from uh, Justina or whoever was sharing before, and we can move on to the next section. So if you can advance, there should be a horizontal demo section, a few more slides. All right, well, I can pick it up from here. So unfortunately, there was a video missing in the middle uh, where we would have shown what it's like to define GA for GH APIs on top of this uh, and do a bit of data discovery and access. In this clip, we're showing what it's like to use a third-party platform for consuming the uh, data. Um, there's data discovery happening here using the Data Connect API, mm -hmm. and there is uh, data consumption using the DERS. And at the end, we can see uh, this is just a simple example workflow that concatenates some files together. And uh, we can see that we've concatenated these three cloud logos that were files loaded from our three different cloud providers. So we can advance to the next slide. Um, so yeah, here's a link to the full video. Again, apologies, folks, for the tef technical difficulties. I'd encourage everyone to uh, watch this if they have some time. It's, it's narrated, so we'll walk through all of the steps that we weren't able to show today. Um, and what's next for viral AI? Um, well, it will be publicly available for researchers soon. Um, and this underlying technology that's shown in this video uh, will be used uh, and developed further for use in the Autism Sharing Initiative Driver Project. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off to Ian Four to talk about the horizontal demo. All right. Thanks, Max. Um, I'm trusting I can be heard okay, and someone will prompt me if uh, if not. I hear a nod, good. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, what Max has been describing with the vertical demo is, I mean, the vertical demo is fast, has gone through the last cycles of plenary and connect. It's really pushed the boat out technically in, in, in stringing together within a single stack. Um, the different, some of the different GA4, GH APIs and standards. In the horizontal demo, we're really broadening that and bringing on board more implementations of, of, the, um, uh, of the APIs, perhaps fewer APIs. And this is um, showing a sampling, and it's only a sampling. It's not meant to be comprehensive of the kinds of services and the kinds of implementers of those services that we've been able to bring together in these FASP scripts, which are uh, Jupyter, Python, uh, IPython scripts to uh, uh, orchestrate different GA4, GH services. And to give an example of that, we'll go to the next slide, which shows how uh, an example of how different GA4GH APIs from different work streams can be put together in a Jupyter notebook to do something useful. So rather than the code itself, this um, 
next slide is going to show how we keep track of things uh, in Python in a data frame as the script uses each GA4 GH API. So if you click, the first uh, service that we hit is the Data Connect service being run by uh, DNA Stack. And though it's being run by DNA Stack, it contains data from um, several of the NCPI and, and dbGaP projects that are available on other platforms. So this is used to query for cases and data according to particular criteria, and we get back both patient demographic data and the DERS IDs for associated CRAM files. What's not shown here is that we can then use the Cancer Research Data Commons DERS service to obtain URLs to access those files, and that access is controlled through the DERS service uh, through proper dbGaP authentication, um, and that service is managed by the University of Chicago's Gen3 platform. So if we click, we can then see that we can use um, the Seven Bridges West service so we're going to a different uh, implementer and a different uh, GA4G8 standard to submit a task to run SAM tools on each of the files using the URLs that we got back from the first step. And we uh, get back the run IDs from that submission. And if we click, we can uh, update that status by calling WES until the task is complete. And if we click again, we can then use DERS again. This time, we're accessing the Seven Bridges DERS service to retrieve the files with the results of the workflow. And if we click, we can merge those with the demographic and phenotypic data that we had from Data Connect at the start. And so the compute gives us something which we would then be able to associate with, with phenotypic data. And we can, we can do a, a genotypic phenotypic analysis. So overall, this demonstrates GA4GH as a set of working APIs that allow federated queries using APIs from multiple organizations uh, to be orchestrated to do a complete task. So we go to the next slide. This shows how this can be applied to site unseen use cases. So this is a use case with a request to look at kids first data um, uh, using generic tools, not on a specific platform, under controlled access. And because of what's in place uh, from the um, set of services that I showed on the first slide, uh, there's in fact an existing DERS service that would allow this to be done. The integration of Passport, as we've seen from the stories about Duos and, and Passport and Dury, you would still have to be going for, a, for these particular data sets. You'd likely still be having to go, out to a, go to a DAC to get access, a data access committee. Um, but Passport can, uh, can accommodate policy change and what the visas allow will, will change over time. One of the great benefits of having these scripts is to be able to bench test these APIs and those kinds of changes as they develop. So on the next slide, um, what I've shown here and the FASP scripts are Python scripting. It's using Jupyter Notebooks. There are many bioinformaticians who want to do that, but we also want to extend this to a wider audience who want to use point and click interfaces and that we saw it kind of in, in, in the vertical demo about how that's beginning to happen within the DNA stack platform, but other platforms like Terra, Seven Bridges, um, uh, LifeBit uh, can provide, can build on these components and the bench testing we can do in, 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 in fast scripts validates is possible, but then that opens it up to scale that up to be point and click uh, which takes more work, so you want to be able to do the prototyping first, but then we can make this available to a wider group of users. So at that point, I'll hand it back over to Brian. Great. Thanks, Ian. If we could just move to the next slide. So you got to see a vertical demo uh, by Max and a horizontal by Ian. I definitely encourage folks to take a look at the full video um, on the vertical demo there. And Ian also gave us kind of a hint of, of what a future demo or series of demos are going to look like when we're starting to talk about user interfaces on top of um, systems that are currently scripted in our demos. So this is all really exciting work. In terms of the next year for FASP, we're going to be working on three different types of goals. The technical goals are continuing to work with these implementations, with the implementers, 
with the um, uh, implementations as part of our demos to produce API feedback and feedback on the implementations too. Uh, as far as our scientific goals, we're continuing to engage on these demos and really driving them with scientific use cases, moving away from just technical use cases to actually being rooted in scientific. Uh, real world use cases. And finally, as far as our social goals go, uh, we want to continue to lean into things like the hackathons and the upcoming Connect meeting, which I hope you'll join the FAST session and join us on that in order to engage with work streams, but also the larger community. So we'll just go to the next slide and say thank you very much, everyone. Sorry for the technical um, uh, issues today, but uh, I hope you enjoy that video offline and I hope you join us for uh, the Connect meeting coming up in a couple weeks, and we're happy to answer questions in Slack or Slido. Yeah, so um, Max, um, Yoon, and Brian, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. It's clear that there's lots of activity um, going on in FASP, that it's working with lots of different standards. Um, and I guess maybe just actually using this time to, to reiterate that if people want to get involved in this, um, to please feel free to, to, to get in touch. Um, and and you. Everybody is welcome in this, and the, the more perspectives we can get on this, the better. Um, I think in the Absolutely. interest of time, we're, we're going to move on just now. Um, but once again, thank you all very much. And if anybody does have any questions, um, please do put them through the chat channels that um, Brian has mentioned. Um, so we're going to move on, I think, now um, to our, our final presentation in the session. Uh, we have Jeremy Adams um, is uh, going to talk to us about the starter kit. Um, work that GA4GH has been working on. So if you could hand over to Jeremy now, please, um, and, and Jeremy's slides, that, that would be wonderful. Hi there, uh, we'll just give it maybe a minute for the slides. The slide, the slides are there, they're just All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy, I'm a senior developer on the GA4GH staff technical team. And today I wanted to talk a bit about the GA4GH starter kit. Uh, so just as a quick note, I'll be referring to some tutorials that you can run through on your own if interested. Uh, you can access those resources from this slide deck uh, that's available at the Billy link you see, uh, or you can just visit the starter kit website directly at starterkit.ga4gh.org. Um, so what is the starter kit? Simply put, it's a suite of open source applications. Uh, each app in the series acts as a server implementation of a GA4GH API specification that you've heard about a lot already, uh, such as DIRS, Data Connect, or Beacon. Uh, we wanted to ensure that there was a simple and comprehensive example of our API specs working in concert uh, as both an educational resource and an on-ramp for newcomers. Uh, you've already heard in, in the program about driver projects uh, implementing GA for GH on their systems at a massive scale. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, the starter kit illustrates that GA for GH is also suitable for small and medium sized environments, uh, such as university labs and demos. The starter kit doesn't leverage any specialized cloud resources. So in that sense, it isn't optimized for any particular platform. Uh, but the key here is versatility. It's possible to deploy the starter kit to get up and running with GA4GH APIs in a variety of contexts, the simplest being your local laptop or a high performance compute cluster or cloud based services like AWS and Google Cloud. We hope this resource will reduce the barrier for members of the community to dip their toes into standardized genomics made possible by GA4GH standards. 
so the core, as I mentioned, the core documentation is located at starterkit.gf4gh.org. Uh, from there, you'll get information on how to download, configure, and launch the Starter Kit apps. For anyone interested in the audience, we recommend you run through the quick start tutorial video. The tutorial gets you set up, gets you to set up and run the DERS API on your local laptop, then execute API calls to access metadata and raw data of a simple test data set according to the DERS specification. We also have a cookbook section, which provides interactive demos for more complicated tasks involving multiple GA4GH APIs. Basically, in the cookbooks, you set up a local network on your machine uh, and execute API calls to each server in the network uh, to accomplish a demo use case. The current cookbook gets you to run a simple workflow to count the number of reads in a BAM file using calls to the GA4GH Workflow Execution Service, or WES API and using DERS to keep track of input file locations uh, over the internet for you. We'll add more cookbooks as new use cases become standardized, such as the token exchange between passports and DERS for control data access you heard about earlier. And through this, we hope to provide a library of data sharing challenges that have been solved by GA4GH standards. Uh, and the starter kit provides a simplified reference model of how these solutions work in practice that anyone can walk through step-by-step -step themselves. Just to give a quick technical overview, the suite of starter kit apps are available as Docker images. We recommend using Docker for portability and ease of use wherever possible, certainly for the local demos that I mentioned, um, but the Java source code is also available for environments that can use Docker for whatever reason. The APIs are backed by a relational database schema. Currently SQLite is supported for development environments and Postgres is supported for more production uh, level environments. Um, and we have scripts and utility apps for helping to set up the table schema on a target database. We also developed an administrative user interface for creating and editing GA4GH data models, such as DERS objects uh, via UI forms, uh, which is the video you see on the right. Uh, this enables anyone to apply GA4GH standards to their own data sets without requiring pre-existing knowledge of the underlying data models. It's pretty neat in that you can configure it to point to one or more starter kit services and then the UI dynamically loads up all the necessary forms associated with the services you registered. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're looking to deploy the starter kit at different sites, especially to demo GA4GH standards working in non-cloud native contexts. Um, lately, our focus has been on running a novel workflow on the high performance compute cluster at the European Bioinformatics Institute or EBI. Uh, CNEST, which is the name of the workflow, it's a novel copy number variation workflow uh, developed by Tom uh, Fitzgerald and Ewan Bernie and others at EBI. Um, so essentially for this demo, we've deployed a mini virtual machine cluster at EBI that mimics the production HPC. Um, and we set up WES and DERS starter kit services on it so that we can launch the CNEST workflow remotely with just a few API calls. The developers of CNS have also written a version of the workflow uh, that has been deployed on Terra Data Repository. And so we plan to run the workflow independently at both of these sites and demonstrate how GFRG standards enable real world science in HPC and cloud environments, and that there's interoperability and reproducibility of results regardless of where the workflow is run. To close up, our team is looking to expand the capabilities of the starter kit, especially by implementing more API specs beyond just DERS and WES. Passports is the current priority because that will enable controlled data access demos, uh, but it's on our roadmap to implement all GA4GH APIs. We will be supporting the starter kit for the foreseeable future. Uh, we plan to stay one-to-one -one with existing APIs as new features are developed so that there's always a reference available for the latest versions of GA4GH specifications. Uh, the main thing uh, that we're actually interested in is getting the starter kit deployed at other sites uh, for other use cases. Even if it's just a scaled down or temporary solution, the starter kit can help to serve as a transitional on-ramp as organizations develop more sophisticated implementations. We've conceived of a second phase to the EBI CNS demo that would involve passports to facilitate access for a pool of trusted users, uh, but we're also looking for other use cases. So uh, that's my call to action. If, if you think the starter kit will help in getting up and running with GA4GH standards at your institute, please reach out to me during or after uh, sorry, during or after plenary to collaborate. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much for your time and uh, happy to take questions uh, if there's time. So thank you very much indeed, Jeremy, for that presentation. It's really great to hear about um, the work that's been going on in Starter Kit. I think we are getting pretty close to the end of the session. So I think um, perhaps time to think about wrapping up. 
um, the session overall. Um, this is bringing us towards the end of track one. Um, it has been great to hear about all of the activity that has been going on in um, across all the standards development. Um, if this is something that you're interested in and that you would like to get involved in, either contributing to standards development or you have use cases or you're interested in adopting the standards, um, please do feel free to, to contact us um, at Secretariat or any of the other contact points that people have shared. Um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers who have contributed uh, to the session today. Um, our wonderful keynote talk from Harold Varmus, uh, Laura for telling us about the wonderful work that has been going on with the EDI group and all of the presenters who have spoken about the standards development work about FASP and, and the starter kit. And thank you for, for, for bearing with the, the, the technical difficulties as well. Um, I'd also like to thank you um, for giving us your attention for this. Um, as I say, this brings us towards the end of track one, but we now have a poster session um, available, um, which I think you can access via the attendee hub. Um, there are some incredible projects represented in the poster session, um, so I'd really encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and we will also have a track two is due to start in, in a few hours time. Um, but once again, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us for this. If you want to get in touch with us, I think um, contact details should be shared via, via attendee hub, etc. Um, and thank you very much. And thank you once again to all of our speakers. Thank you. <laughs>